As a kid, I was always the one who would ask questions, even when that curiosity became incessant, annoying. The truth is that my drive to know more has always been a part of who I am and how I behave. The desire to possess more knowledge is something that is evident and resonant in today's quotation from James Thurber. It is better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. What we can understand from this quotation is that we don't have to be absolutely sure of the result of our convictions, but we have to have convictions about learning more and learning more about our world. First, we'll understand this through the philosopher René Descartes. Next, through the horror movie director and experimentalist John Carpenter. And finally, through the literary character of Huckleberry Finn in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. So first, let's take a look at the philosopher of René Descartes, a man who believed, just like this quotation, that answers weren't everything. Descartes believed that he could gain a more honest understanding of the world by challenging our conception of knowledge itself. He believed that knowledge was hierarchical, meaning that we built our assumptions based on things we already assumed to be true. So the result was just a mess of lies of which we governed our society. The way to remedy this problem, he posited, was that we could challenge these conceptions of what knowledge was in politics, in social studies, and in science. So in the end, he's a man who doubted everything and asked questions. But just like this quotation says, he wasn't a man who sincerely sought out the answers. He simply was there as a catalyst for society to change the things that it had always taken for granted. And by challenging the fact that these conventions were so traditional and so grounded in the way be we behaved, he made us realize that that behavior wasn't necessarily the only one or the correct one to behave as. Finally, rather next, let's take a look at a director who asked questions about his own genre. John Carpenter was a revolutionary inventive horror director behind classics such as Halloween and It. Rather, Halloween and The Thing. John Carpenter is a man who is looked up by horror fans as a legend, but the truth is that his films were not always successes. What his goal was to constantly reinvent the horror genre, whether that meant by introducing Michael Myers as a serial killer with a familial background, or introducing The Thing as a creature rather than a person who was terrorizing its characters. John Carpenter is a man who wanted to provoke the horror genre to change and morph its shape and didn't really care what that shape was. Just like this quotation is advising us, he asked the questions to what the horror genre could potentially be, but he didn't have a set mindset of that result. And the truth is, not having an objective idea of where his projects would take him ultimately made him more successful in the end because he had no idea the scope and full extent of his creativity. Finally, let's take a look at the literary character of Huckleberry Finn, as shown in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Huck is a character who simply challenges the world around him. As a child growing up in what he calls a civilized society, he is forced to learn in barriers that restrict him, with constructs such as education and religion, things that he feels like are limiting his spirit and his creativity. Huck is a child who challenges these conventions and asks why they are valid in the first place. This is why he runs away, sets out on an adventure of his own, not, believe, not because he believes he knows the destination of this adventure or the answer to his own identity, but because just like this quotation says, he's willing to ask the questions and this is his greatest asset. So today we've seen how when we are embarking on our own journeys, we don't necessarily need to have all the answers. We first saw this through the philosopher René Descartes and the way that he challenged basic societal conventions. Next, through the filmmaker John Carpenter and in the way that he morphed the horror genre to whatever he saw fit creatively. And finally, we saw the character of Huck Finn that if we challenge the societal conventions around us, we can become new people, even if we don't know exactly who those people will be. 
And the truth is, whether we're talking about a fictional literary character who has transcended generations, or simply me in my science class continuing to ask questions, curiosity is an invaluable asset. Thank you. The bell was going to ring in 30 seconds, and the window to talk to my econ class crush was quickly closing. So, in an act of utter desperation, I said the smartest thing I could think of. So, what do you think of the Bitcoin? After an awkward glance and quick explanation that Bitcoin is not preceded by the, I was officially mortified and couldn't look at him for the rest of the hour. Conversations about Bitcoin are bound to happen, and it's up to you to be prepared. Today, I am going to unravel the seemingly secretive history behind Bitcoin, explain how it works, and give you the information you need to understand what role you may play in its future. Bitcoin's story begins in 2008, when an unknown person or persons using the alias Satoshi Nakamoto posted the idea for digital currency on the internet. Bitcoin was born in the midst of the recession as a way to remove money from the hands of the banks and governments who had let the global economy slip out of control. On the Bitcoin network, purchases are made anonymously, leaving no money trail. As you can imagine, this meant that the original users of Bitcoin were some shady characters. But soon, legitimate users began to see the value of cryptocurrency, a type of digital money. International payments are easy and cheap, as they're subject to no additional fees. And Bitcoin is a universal currency, as there's no exchange rate. Unlike traditional money such as the dollar or the euro, no government issues it, and no bank holds it. In other words, Bitcoin is decentralized. Additionally, Bitcoin is completely transparent, as there's a public record of every Bitcoin transaction made. And those transactions are secure, protected by sophisticated encryption techniques that experts claim are impenetrable. Today, you and I can pay for a pizza using Bitcoin, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, it took two years for someone to actually purchase a commodity using Bitcoin. This first recorded purchase of value was in 2010, when a Bitcoin owner asked someone to deliver him two Papa John's pizzas in exchange for 10,000 Bitcoins. Subsequently, Bitcoin owners began trading their digital currency for everything, from coffee to cars, leading the free market to drive the value of Bitcoin, the same as it does with any other type of currency. U.S. dollars get printed in the U.S. Mint, but how is Bitcoin created? Nakamoto was clever. He knew that an unlimited supply of Bitcoin would make it worthless. The same is true with today's economy. If the U.S. Mint printed too many bills, the value of each dollar would drop. So Nakamoto decided that only 21 million Bitcoin would be created, ever. To preserve their value, Bitcoin are released to the marketplace little by little through a complicated math game called mining. The people who play it use computers called miners. The operators of miners solve complex math equations and each time he or she wins, they're rewarded in new Bitcoin that can then be used in the marketplace. After Bitcoin is created by the miners, it gets registered onto an electronic ledger, like a spreadsheet, shared with Bitcoin users all over the world. This database is called the blockchain. The blockchain is updated every 10 minutes and records every Bitcoin transaction, making the records public, traceable, and storing them permanently on the network. The owner of the Bitcoin involved in a transaction and the transaction itself are identified only by a string of assigned numbers, unique to each transaction. These unique transaction numbers are a protection that make identity theft nearly impossible. Experts claim that these algorithms cannot be solved by human or electronic calculation. And so far, they've been right. According to University of Pittsburgh professor Chris Wilmer, Bitcoin itself has never been hacked. 
So who is in charge of Bitcoin? Well, actually anyone who wants to get involved with it. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So there's no official headquarters or owner. This sophisticated encrypted computer program is controlled by Bitcoin owners and users. So how can we get Bitcoin and where do we keep it? One way to become a Bitcoin owner is through online websites called digital exchanges, where you can trade US dollars for Bitcoin. Two popular exchanges are Coinbase and Bitstamp. They swap one currency for another so that you can buy what you need. But what can Bitcoin buy you anyway? Well, according to a list compiled this year by author Jonas Chokin, your Bitcoin can be used at Whole Foods and Subway, in addition to online retailers like Expedia and Overstock.com. But once you have Bitcoin, where do you keep it? Bitcoin is stored in a digital wallet. Think of it like a bank account used to send and receive Bitcoin. You do need to know that Bitcoin is not regulated by the government, so your nest egg is not insured. If your personal server is hacked, Bitcoin can be stolen, and it can be accidentally deleted or destroyed by viruses. However, this can be prevented by backing up and saving your digital wallet. Aside from the benefit of using Bitcoin to buy and sell goods and services, you can also purchase it as an investment in the same way that an investor might purchase any other type of currency, hoping to cash in on its fluctuation. You may have heard of friends or relatives making and then losing small fortunes in the last few months, trading Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. These dramatic ups and downs have generated a lot of buzz in the media, as well as interest and skepticism. Today, we have uncovered the cryptic history behind Bitcoin, how it works, and the pros and cons of its usage. Whether you choose to buy it as an investment, use it as a currency, or ignore it altogether, you should now understand that your decision does impact the value of Bitcoin. Unfortunately, I struck it out with the boy from econ class, but hopefully we all learned from my mistake. Bitcoin is more than just a conversation starter. The information I gave you today can help you answer questions on Jeopardy. You can use Bitcoin to buy you a cup of coffee or even to make you big money. What you choose to do with the Bitcoin is up to you. What's that smell? I'm cooking. <laughs> really? You don't cook? Well, I do tonight. What you cooking then? Your favorite food. Mmm, what's the occasion? Mm. Does a husband need an <laughs> occasion to woo his wife? Oh, so you're wooing me. <laughs> woo woo! <laughs> Should have cooked for me when we first met. You know, ladies love that. Well, I had to catch you before I could poison you. <laughs> Troy. Mm. I'm pregnant. <coughs> what? I'm sure, too. I've gone to the doctor, taken the test. So? I'm shocked. <laughs> well, you can't be too shocked. Be proud, Michael. You've got swimmers. So are you happy? <laughs> Am I happy? Yes, Michael, are you happy that we're pregnant? I'm pregnant? <laughs> we're gonna have a baby! <laughs> we're going to have a baby. Raise your hand if your parents have ever told you that your birth was the best thing that ever happened to them. Well, they're probably lying, but congrats to you. However, baby jokes aside, Psychology Today explains that, inevitably, all relationships undergo conflicts. And it is important that we understand and express the emotions that our relationship triggers. In other words, it is vital that we make the bond with our partner unbreakable. A, A Very, very common, common Procedure by Courtney Barron. As we were finishing building the crib, we started talking. <clears throat> arguing about baby names. Um, Angelica. Ugh. Samantha? No. Madeline. She's not a dang cookie. But the real fight was over the name Virginia. It sounds like vagina! But we did name her Baby. We named her Baby. We named her Baby. I figured a name can wait. 
I guess we'd look into her little baby eyes and just know what she's called then. And on the topic of names, I asked Carolyn to call me Daddy. You know, just to try things out. I'm not calling you Daddy. Father? Poppy! Hmm. Master Jedi? No. Nope. <laughs> Jeez. What? Parents. Uh, Ugh. So we call for a meeting of the families. We decide to do it over brunch because brunch seems like a good time to talk about pregnancy. Right? I think we just said dinner seemed too... To adult. Did we really? Yeah. So we meet for eggs. To announce the eggs. But Michael and I both order pancakes. We make the egg <laughs> joke on the way to brunch, but then it didn't seem so cute to actually eat them when we were there. Actually, throughout my whole pregnancy, I can't even eat eggs. Yeah. And I can't eat sperm. Charming. Excuse me. Anyway, my mother had bought us this set of plaid Burberry sippy cups and commented how no baby should be without style. And then later after her second Bloody Mary, my mother loves brunch, she said, holding up one of the sippy cups. Wouldn't these make great flasks? Secret to motherhood, let me tell ya. Michael! Before we even get to the subway, we turn to each other and say, we, we are, are not letting, letting our parents, parents near, near the, the baby. baby. Your mom would set up a PlayStation of knives on a hot stove. Well, and your mom would spike the bottles of milk with bourbon. Okay, <laughs> let's swear to never leave our child in the exclusive stead of our parents. I swear. <laughs> We're gonna be good at this. I can tell. God, I love you. I remember when Carolyn and I first met, and She'd said something like, you will always be successful at being you. I know that she meant I would never get past my own limitations. Uh, no, 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 that is not what I said. What I meant was, you're so successful at being you, you're true to yourself. And then that's when you responded. <sighs> that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. No, really, I mean it. It's like, you know who you are and you accept it with such an admirable intensity. I really love getting to know you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, my last girlfriend, she didn't want to get to know me. She wanted to change the way I dressed. Did she? No. I'm gonna warn you. What? <laughs> I might try to take you shopping. Is it that bad? I don't know, Michael. That's just a lot of brown. I like brown. <laughs> you look like a freaking Cocoa Puff. I'm successfully being me. <laughs> yeah? And... I want to successfully be me kissing you. <sighs> eh. What do you think? I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> I fell in love with that woman on the first date. It's a sunny Friday in October when I'm eight months pregnant. I'm not gonna say that pregnancy was blissful, but it was good. <laughs> Tired and fat, but good. And I was walking down the street on my way to mommy to be yoga class. When I feel this trickle, and I start crying and I call for a cab right away because you know, you just know. And so I call Michael and I tell him, Michael, I'm wet. Nice. <laughs> no, I think my water just broke. What? It can't, it's not time, it's too early. <laughs> I know. You want me to come? I can leave work. No. You'll be fine. I know. You will. I know. I'll call you. Three hours later, we're in the delivery room and our baby was born. <laughs> she was. She was small. A peanut. <laughs> she was a peanut. But then the doctor tells us that there was a complication. That they're taking our newborn daughter to get an MRI. And I feel sick. 
It's, it's a, a very, very common, common procedure. procedure, the doctor said. But we're hopeful that your daughter will be fine. Old people die. That's natural. That is what I had always thought, but... But when our baby girl died, I wasn't just sad or upset or angry. I was honestly perplexed because babies don't die. Babies don't die, but when that happens, it's unspeakable. When it happens, you aren't there. You can't give her the only thing you can give. You can't touch her head and let her slip away knowing she's loved. You can't. Can't do anything. Can't be a father. It's a very, it's a very common, common procedure. procedure. They said. But we're sorry. Your baby you died, died in, in the, the operating room. room. It's been a month. Michael cleared the apartment of baby things. It's been a month. And I miss my wife. I don't need to be comforted. Then what do you need? Our baby? I hate it when you- You know, I hate this apartment! Then let's move. I don't want to. Do you have any idea what you're being like? Yes. Then stop! No. Grow up! Excuse me? This happened to me too! Oh, this? This happened to you? Don't touch me! Don't ever touch me! Oh, are you leaving, Michael? Because I want you to! You know, I want you to hell out! No, you don't, Carolyn! This isn't you! I know. I'm sorry, I am. Michael, we didn't even get to give her a name. And I should have done it better. Don't say that. I know I could have done it better. I should have helped I can't. you. I can't. I shouldn't you have walked around. You didn't make this happen. So it's awful that it happened, Carolyn. Like I need you, please, Carolyn. You need me too. Baby died. Our baby died. I love you. Just died. please <laughs> look at me. <laughs> I want to be with you. I know. And you want to be with me? I do. Then let's move. To where? I don't know, Carolyn. We could go anywhere. What about your job? It took us, what, five years to get here? I'll get another job. We built our lives. We can still do this. We're parents of a dead baby. We're not only that. What else are we? Together. In January of 2016, rapper and voice of our generation, B.O.B. tweeted, no matter how high in elevation you go, the horizon is always eye level. Sorry, cadets, I didn't want to believe it either. And in 140 characters, B.O.B. clearly earned his philosophy degree and turned Hellenistic astronomy, Ferdinand Magellan's circumnavigation of the Earth, and NASA on their heads. Suggesting the Earth was flat, B.O.B.'s revolutionary revival of Ptolemaic thinking spawned a slew of hashtag Flat Earth tweets, each claiming indisputable proof of the Earth's tabletop nature. For example, why do all the buildings in NYC stand straight up? Hashtag Flat Earth. As well as, if Earth is a spinning globe and the sun is supposedly light years away, how come sun rays beam straight down? Hashtag Flat Earth. Centuries of scientific development foiled by B.O.B. and Tila Tequila. 
Flat earthers may seem harmless, but the plausibility of such widespread misunderstanding is indicative of a larger issue in our society. Americans are shying away from science. Just weeks ago, the U.S. dropped out of the top 10 in the Bloomberg Innovation Index, which ranks international countries on criterion such as research and development, patents, and post-secondary education. Robert Atkinson, president of an innovation foundation in Washington, D.C., argues that the drop reflects a grim reality that the U.S. is currently suffering from a lack of initiatives to encourage scientific development, stalling both social and economic progress. So today, we will hypothesize some causes to our decline in science literacy, observe some social effects before finally rigorously testing some solutions to the fear of science, an issue that CNN of April 13th, 2010 believes will kill us. Oh, CNN, you're so overdramatic. Besides, that was 2010 and we're not dead yet. We're just stupid. As John Miller, professor of integrated studies at Michigan State University puts it, 70% of Americans cannot understand the science section of the New York Times. And our aversion to science starts young, due to the way we teach science and the stigma surrounding the subject. First off, our education system discourages scientific exploration. Education professional Alan Colburn explains that elementary school teachers are often apprehensive and unenthusiastic about science themselves. But even when teachers like science, we are testing the subject in a rigid rather than creative manner. Biologist Bruce Alberts explains that high-stakes state-developed exams drive teachers to teach them. These simple, low-cost, multiple-choice tests mean no real science exploration in the classroom. No planting seeds and watching them grow, no baking soda and vinegar volcanoes, no dissections. It is much easier to test for science words than it is to test for science understanding. We've sucked the excitement out of science. Thus, it's no surprise that the Washington Post of December 16, 2016 reveals that U.S. students rank 25th out of 35 top industrial nations in quality of science education. Similarly, tired scientific teaching practices have led students to stigmatize science itself with labels like boring, tedious, impossibly hard, which leads students to avoid a science education altogether. According to the College Board, the AP Chemistry exam constituted only 3.3% of AP exams taken in 2016, while AP English exams made up 20.3%. English may be perceived as easier, but students are also being taught to view science credits as less valuable. The Simon Foundation reports that while 89% of parents believe fundamentals in reading, math, and writing were very important to get a good job, only 59% of parents reported a similar importance with science. With little familial faith and rigorous dry material, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology reveals that roughly 40% of students planning to major in engineering and science end up switching to other subjects, opting for easier alternatives. That's some sad science. You know what else is sad? I honestly had to think about it when I saw the hashtag Flat Earth post trending. Like, I legitimately had to stop myself and go, but how do you know, Simona? How do you know the Earth is round? How do you know your right and legendary rapper B.O.B. is wrong? Our lack of a foundation in scientific knowledge manifests itself in two critical ways inaccurate reporting of science, and in turn general disregard for scientific findings. Journalist Dan Rather embodied the media's haphazard treatment of science with the quotation, if I were to generously grade mainstream media on science coverage, I would give us a C. Afraid of alienating readers, articles relating to scientific topics are dumbed down. Statistics, scientific vocabulary, and other evidence are traded in for quick, stimulating conclusions that are often inaccurate. News sources will even shy away from important science stories in the fear that they are too complicated. Science can be silenced, but its complexity often leads to twisted or misreported information. In 1998, Dr. Andrew Wakefield and a team of 11 other scientists reported that they had discovered a link between the commonly administered measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine and the cognitive impairment autism. 
Over a decade later, 10 of 12 scientists on the team, including Wakefield himself, have retracted their findings. But the damage has already been done. Despite new evidence, many blogs still cite Wakefield's study as valid, and the CDC reports that over 57% of non-vaccinating parents insist a link exists between autism and medical treatments. The media can spread false scientific information quickly, but it also allows for a large amount of content production in a short period of time. Reporters vying for an audience will often release science stories before results of scientific studies are even published, leading to a slew of conflicting information. This week, coffee causes cancer. The next, it does not. When faced with sloppy science reporting, many of us become overwhelmed or frustrated with the amount of conflicting information and instead turn to scientific conclusions that support our previously held worldview, a phenomenon known as confirmation bias. In other words, we throw the science behind the conclusions out the window and simply believe whatever aligns best with our perspective, defeating the purpose of science in the first place. Inaccurate reporting and our inability to understand scientific data ourselves has real-world consequences. In August 2017, Hurricane Harvey wreaked havoc in Houston. Climate scientist Kevin Trenberth explains that homes and lives may have been saved if officials and policymakers had incorporated the recommendations of sound science in their plans. Despite data on the effect of climate change on storms, no preventative measures were taken to ensure the safety of Houstonians. In fact, our disregard for science likely contributed to the strength of the storm. Climate scientist Kevin Trenberth explains that human contributions to climate change can be responsible for up to 30 percent or so of the total rainfall coming out of the storm. Americans clearly disregard science at their own risk quicker than B.O.B. throws out the laws of physics. Rethinking science education and fixing science communications are two ways we can begin to up our science IQ. It's not surprising that a renewal of scientific literacy must begin with education and teaching. At the secondary level, this means teaching applications of science rather than rote memorization of facts. Natasha Wadlington, a scholar at the University of Chicago, explains that classrooms should be safe havens where students can explore and discover science on their own terms. K-12 teachers should undergo specialty science training, and teaching science should be popularized as a respectable profession among science majors. Next, we need to fix communications between scientists and the public. Topics need not be dumbed down, but rather simplified in a way that is relatable to non-majors. By making content relatable, engagement rises and even non-majors can feel comfortable with topics being discussed. The same goes for articles written about scientific topics. Rather than completely abolishing complex topics, reporters just need to put complicated vocabulary in simpler terms. As legendary science journalist Tim Radford puts it, don't overestimate your readers' knowledge and don't underestimate their intelligence. And readers, be an informed consumer. Although checking sources may remind you of that one freshman writing class that you just wish to forget, oftentimes a simple check for validity can reveal the flaws in bad science reporting. Speaking of bad science, I realized I was right. The Earth is round and we can tell this every day simply by looking at the existence of time zones, sundials, a picture of Earth from space. After examining the problems, causes, and solutions to our experimental evasions, we should realize that a renewal of scientific literacy must begin with a renewal of scientific education. And while it may be too late to convince B.O.B. of some elementary science, hopefully we can still save future generations from similar hashtag flat earth dilemmas. Thank you. You know what I love to do in the morning? Slip on my nylons, dress, and high heels. Okay, seriously. I'm most comfortable in my sweatpants and a soft, breathable shirt. Probably just like you. Thank goodness I've discovered a novel new clothing company, Two Blind Brothers. The brothers draw on their heightened sense of touch to create this tactile vision of comfort. A classic line of cozy shirts, all stitched together with good intentions. Today, 
Comfortable, high quality clothing is in store as we weave our way through the history of Two Blind Brothers. Shop its clean and classic line of clothing, cut away the competition, and finally, iron out how this unique clothing company is helping cure blindness one shirt at a time. Fashion your seatbelts for this inspiring retail adventure. When brothers Bradford and Brian Manning were five and seven, they began to lose their vision due to a retinal eye disease. Fast forward 25 years to 2016, the Manning brothers are legally blind. They see at 20 feet what someone with perfect vision sees at 400 feet. They use magnifying glasses to read and have also learned braille. However, rather than hold them back, their visual challenge became the fuel driving them forward. These brothers left careers in finance to launch a small clothing company that is also a nonprofit on a mission to cure blindness. The brothers are obsessed with the way clothing feels and equally committed to finding a cure for blindness. Fortunate to have success from their previous jobs in finance, they have chosen to not even take a salary, donating 100% of the profits from two blind brothers to help cure blindness. One year later, it's one of the fastest growing charitable brands in the country. Now, their parents laughed when they left their finance jobs to start a fashion line, pointing out that the two can barely dress themselves. But when the going gets tough, the tough gets sewing. The result is a clothing line focused on what we really want, quality, cozy shirts. So try the world's softest shirts on for size. The first thing you will notice when you try on Two Blind Brothers apparel is that style has not been sacrificed for comfort. It's crazy soft. All of their shirts are made from luxurious bamboo, known for its softness, strong natural cotton, and shape holding lycra, making you feel like each shirt is giving you a gentle hug. Braille is incorporated in every piece of clothing they make representing their struggle with blindness and as a physical reminder of their mission to cure it. The online store currently offers more than 40 high quality t-shirts, Henleys, and hoodies, and size options from extra extra small to extra large, and all items are washer and dryer friendly. Each shirt is named for a special person, place, or inspiration to the brothers. And with an attractive price point starting at $30, it won't be hard to enhance your wardrobe. A must-have is the classic Cape Cod hoodie in traditional navy blue, named for fond childhood memories of the brothers. Looks sophisticated while feeling casual in this or three other fantastic colors. Next, this simple white short sleeve v-neck is the Ellen, named for none other than Ellen DeGeneres. She inspires the world to be kind to one another, and wearing these touchable shirts just might inspire you to be too. This shirt is also available in a variety of colors and is great by itself or for layering. Now, if something unique is more your style, check out this long sleeve Henley with a solid front and striped back, known as the Gund, named for Gordon Gund, founder of the Foundation for Fighting Blindness. Choose one of five color combinations and you join his fight. The Two Blind Brothers collection would not be complete without Henleys in a variety of colors named for their own family members. The Katie, for their sister, honoring her love of life. And the Diane and Paul, for their beloved parents who faced their boy's diagnosis with courage and instilled in them the determination to help cure blindness one cozy piece of clothing at a time. This is just a sneak peek at the collection, available on their website, twoblindbrothers.com. And remember, their shirts feel seriously good, and curing blindness feels even better. So let's unravel the competition's portfolio and see why your next shirt should be won from Two Blind Brothers, based on price, quality, sustainability, USA Pride, and eye-opening generosity. This tank top available from Alternative Apparel does not size up. It is a not-so-ideal blend of polyester, a synthetic material, and rayon, which is pre-treated with caustic chemicals to survive washing. It is reasonably priced, selling for $32, but is poor quality, manufactured from completely non-sustainable fabrics, and is a company of imported clothing that exercises zero charitable giving. Next, take a peek at this tank from Nike.com. 
This top is also 100% polyester, non-breathable, nor earth-friendly, yet ironically called Nike Breathe Elastica. It sells for a whopping $45. Admittedly, the company does participate in charity, spanning a number of causes. However, Nike Apparel is made in 34 countries, but not the USA. Let's see how two blind brothers can't be beat. This shirt, like their entire collection, is the ideal bamboo cotton lycra blend for the perfect look and feel. Bamboo and cotton are natural fibers that are breathable and kind to your skin. This awesome tank, no matter how many washes, will always look new. It's competitively priced at $30. So now you see, it's a sheer win for two blind brothers with the perfect combination of very soft, high quality, earth-friendly fabrics manufactured in the USA and 100% of the profits from two blind brothers are donated to curing blindness. The philanthropic efforts of two blind brothers are eye-opening and begin in their Dallas-based factory. 70% of the company's employees are blind or visually impaired. Further, all of the profits from two blind brothers are donated to curing blindness. And the company's efforts get an impressive head start since Bradford and Brian do not take a salary. The brothers have personally selected beneficiaries like the Foundation Fighting Blindness, which has developed a successful gene therapy for a retinal disease that causes blindness at birth. Last year alone, two Blind Brothers customers helped fund over 30,000 hours of clinical studies. Every shirt sold it means being one step closer to a cure for blindness, which impacts over 180 million people worldwide. Bradford and Brian's eyesight may be impaired, but their field of vision is extraordinary. Through their clothing company, TwoBlindBrothers.com, they have made it easy for us to support curing blindness simply by buying and enjoying comfortable, high-quality clothing that we want to have. Helping to cure vision by purchasing what may just be the softest clothing ever made makes perfect sense. Growing up, I was a big fan of making a mess. Whether these messes meant throwing clothes all over my room looking for my favorite princess dress or destroying my mom's work of art in the kitchen because I was trying to create rainbow sugar cookies. Regardless, even if my actions as a younger child resulted in a mess, I always seemed to have fun the messier I got. And this mess was driven by one thing, curiosity. I was always curious to find another way to do something, to find another way to make my sugar cookies a little bit more magical, curious on how I could make my princess dress sparkle just a little bit brighter. James Thurber once said, it is better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. Thurber's message can be interpreted to mean that in life, the drive for curiosity always defeats taking what is given to you or the easy way out. We can examine this through Ray Bradbury's novel Fahrenheit 451, popular British celebrity Simon Cowell, and finally by examining historia, figure of history Hercules Mulligan. We begin by examining the dystopian society described in Bradbury's novel Fahrenheit 451. The setting takes place in a life where government has complete censorship con and control over everyone and works in an attempt to control its people by suppressing their curiosity. The main character, Guy Montag, expresses his feelings of curiosity as he searches to find his own true meaning of life rather than conforming to society's beliefs. In his journey, his curiosity defies drives him to defy society's expectations of him and he is able to find a place in which he can call his home, somewhere off of the grid where the government can't control him. It is this curiosity that drives him to find this new meaning of life that gives him purpose. In Bradbury's novel, we see how censorship of this curiosity is the biggest evil. But a person's ability to drive this curiosity to allow them to explore new possibilities and other ways of life is indeed the most beautiful thing and is always better than taking the easy way out. 
Next, we can examine Simon Cowell's curiosity within the arts industry and see how it allowed him to further his own career and create an incredible life for himself and change the face of the singing competition industry. Simon Cowell began his career at a TV production company where, as many don't know, he failed miserably. But Simon knew that he had a drive within himself for seeking out talent and he loved to see the passion of others as they performed. He was curious to see where this could take him. So he began to judge for famous TV singing competitions. His curiosity within the arts drove him to finding this new career and allowed him to create an incredible platform of performing on and judging on competitions like American Idol and America's Got Talent. It was his curiosity from within that drove him to these extents and allowed him to create this position for himself. Finally, we can examine a figure of history, Hercules Mulligan, and see how his curiosity drove him to be able to play a large role in the American Revolution. Hercules Mulligan was a young tailor, but he had an idea. He believed that he could take his own skills and use them to get an in within the British government and become a spy and report back to the American patriots fighting in the Revolution. Many didn't believe in his ideas because they believed they were a bit foolish and even childish to think a tailor spying on the British government. But Mulligan was very curious. He thought that his ideas could play a big role and be extremely beneficial. It was this curiosity that caused him to endure these struggles of finding his way in as a spy. And in doing so, he was able to become very successful and deliver important information back to the Patriots of America fighting in the revolution, but he was only able to do so because of his immense curiosity. Today, we examine James Thurber's words. It is better to know some of the questions than all of the answers and seeing how, rather than taking what is given to you, but exploring curiosity and the drive to find new things is the most important. We saw how Fahrenheit 51, Guy Montag's curiosity allowed him to create a better life. Cowell was able to create an incredible career for himself. And finally, Hercules Mulligan, who was able to use his curiosity to benefit the American Revolution. We talk about you behind your back, Samantha Oswald. In the hallways, in the bathroom, in the cafeteria. We talk about you all the time. You know how you have straight A's, but no friends. How you're actually proud of playing the oboe in the marching band. <laughs> we also talk about how your hair gives off that, uh, that dull, disgusting glow when you walk under the fluorescent lights of the hallway. <laughs> Maud, yeah, she cringes every time you walk by her. Oh my god. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. And the rest of us? We agree. Basically what I'm saying is, we are the rich, the pretty, the athletic. And we love you, Samantha Oswald. <laughs> the way tires love asphalt. According to Youth Advocacy Group Ambassador for Kids, one out of every five students admits to participating in some form of bullying on a daily basis. So with Snapchat and other forms of social media rising, bullying is transcending high school hallways and are ever present in the lives of teens today. Now what you're about to hear may make you uncomfortable, but despite its abrasiveness, it is imperative that we listen to the voices of bullies as they give us a glimpse into their deeply held insecurities unlocking the key to societal resistance and the courage to speak up. We Are the Pretty by Ryan McRoad. See, we have a plan for you, Samantha. We told Matt Rotz that you have a crush on him. You know Matt Rotz, <laughs> captain of the JV swim team. <laughs> He's a sophomore and he has a car. Anyway, we all want him, but we want to show you what you can't have. 
So, you know, we spend a week on Matt cultivating his attraction. We inject him with confidence, massaging his ego, telling him, you know, Samantha is so into you. You know, she's just a little shy. You have to take her out. Matt starts to come around. See, Matt tells us that you're smart, funny, and easy to talk to. But really, he just feels sorry for you and hasn't realized it yet. <laughs> you know, he's not over Katie Coltsmith, and his judgment is just a little bit clouded. We just need Matt to rebound before we can make our move. <sighs> your hair is glittering like nuclear waste when he stops at your locker. You know, he leans on the wall the way he always does. His t-shirt squared up against his broad shoulders. And he smiles at you. We lean in so we can hear him deliver the lines we have sculpted onto his tongue. You know, casual yet carefully crafted, slowly pulling you into the big question, oh, hey, Samantha, you know, uh, I was wondering if maybe you wanted to come over this weekend, watch a movie. We suppress our knowing smiles. But what do you do? You smile your stupid smile and you say, um, Matt, I think it'd just be better off if we stayed friends. And you send him back to us. Oh my God, <laughs> what a bitch. And you know, the rest of us, we agree. I mean, who do you think you are, Samantha? I mean, I mean, we won't ask you that to your face, but we will spend all weekend asking each other what is wrong with you. I mean, well, you're the only girl in the graphic novel club. You have no friends, unless you count Ms. Woodward, the history teacher, and you always wear the same hoodie. You never wash it. We know because that dandruff kicked on your shoulders is always thicker than it was the day before. And honey, nobody's actually proud of playing the frickin' oboe. I mean, compared to you, we're basically goddesses. Aphrodite, Athena, all at once. And we say it to each other like passing the peace at church. Because honey, there is safety in numbers. I mean, look at Amber over there. Muffy topping over her size eights. She's fat and everybody knows it. But we say nothing when she drowns her salad in ranch dressing and cheese because she is us. Now don't misunderstand, we're not fat though. Uh, Kayla was once in middle school, but now she works at Hollister and her thighs don't even touch. We all envy her, but you know, not too much because she does throw up her food every day and she has boobs the size of a middle schooler. And uh, Jill, Jill will never make first string for basketball. And Sarah will go to second base with anybody. And Andrea's left boob is bigger than her right boob. And Maude wears prescription deodorant. And we are all victims here. Except for you, Samantha. So go ahead, hold your head high. Wear that dandruff caked marching band hoodie with pride. We know who you really are. On Monday after school, you stop at Matt's locker. You know, your hair is neatly put into a ponytail and it is so obvious that you're finally starting to try. <laughs> I mean, haven't you heard? Matt and Maude hooked up this weekend. I mean, everybody is talking about it, but I guess the problem is nobody talks to you. Hey, Matt, um, you know, I was wondering if maybe you wanted to come over and play Nintendo. I, I just got that new Mario Kart game that came out, and hey, I'd love to. You laugh and it makes us want to stone you to death. <laughs> the final dismissal bell goes off and you walk away. But Maud, Maud is pissed. She shoves Matt hard with one arm, but Matt doesn't even move. And that's when I realize Matt has already had his rebound. Maud, and he is up for grabs. As Matt walks away, Maud flings her books on the ground.
but none of us move to help her. She stands up and walks away. Oh my God, <laughs> what a bitch. And the rest of us? We agree. The end of North Korea's weapons program, a shooting in Nashville, and news from a local preschool. All of this and more coming up on WALK News. I'm Caitlin Finnerty, and for the next five minutes, I will be walking you through today's top stories. We start in Syria. International experts from the Global Agency for the Monitoring of Chemical Weapons set off to the site of a suspected April 7th gas attack in Syria. Inspectors from the Organization of the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons were delayed for one week in Damascus before they could visit the town, just minutes away from the capital where the alleged attack occurred. The town of Dauma was at the time under rebel control and facing ferocious government air and ground assault. Militants gave up the town just days after the alleged attack. The beginning of weapons in Syria to the possible end of them in North Korea. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un announced he will suspend nuclear and long-range missile tests and plans to close a nuclear test site. The Korean Central News Agency, which is North Korea's state media agency, made the announcement as the nation's reclusive leader is on, in ongoing peace talks with the South Korean president and also with President Donald Trump. The Korean news agency said the nation would freeze its nuclear tests and long-range missiles, specifically intercontinental ballistic missiles, on April 21st. Walking into national news, the suspect of a deadly shooting at a Waffle House was arrested on Monday, more than a day after four people died and others were injured at the 24-hour restaurant in the southeast Nashville neighborhood of Antioch. A tip from a construction worker led police to Travis Ranking, 29, of Morton, Illinois, and an end to a 34-hour manhunt. Ranking was carrying a loaded silver handgun and a flashlight in a black backpack less than a mile from the shooting scene and close to an elementary school. Ranking was taken to a nearby police station where he requested a lawyer and refused to give a statement. While Nashville is mourning for, this former president is dealing with his own health after mourning his late wife. Former President George H.W. Bush was taken to a Houston hospital with an infection the day after attending the funeral for his wife of 73 years. Bush, 93, was taken to the Houston Met Methodist Hospital Sunday with an infection that has spread to his blood. He is responding to treatment and appears to be recovering, Bush spokesman Jim McGrath said. The 41st president was in critical condition and his blood pressure dropped dangerously low before stabilizing. We finish our broadcast in local news for our featured story of the day. Huda Danaway said she was shocked when she went to pick up her five-year-old son from preschool on March 27th and was told that he was found during lunchtime with his mouth taped shut and his food thrown in the garbage. My heart dropped, she told the Free Press. Danaway said she was told by one of the teachers in the Crestwood School District's preschool program who walked in and discovered what a substitute teacher aide had done on March 26th. Danaway said no one from the program called to tell her what happened, and instead she found out when picking up her son the next day. This brings us to today's edition of The Sidewalk, where I give my views on today's featured story. Please note that the following views are my own and do not reflect those of WALK News or its affiliates. As a student with a younger sibling in a similar setting to this one, I feel real emotion towards this story and Huda Danaway and her son. I think that any person who is so emotionless and incredibly impatient to tape a young child's mouth and throw away their food should really redetermine their career path in teaching. School environments have changed in the last 10 years, and while discipline is still important, nothing like this will ever be okay. A parent sends their children to school under the impression that they will get a safe learning environment where they're supposed to grow. How can any parent be confident to send their child to a place where the administration hires a teacher, substitute or not, that thinks action like this is okay? 
Direct consequences need to stem from behavior like this from teachers, starting first by firing the awful substitute, and then by making sure all new teachers to a building are observed and follow any school protocol that might be unfamiliar to those where discipline act disciplinary action was taken just a bit differently. We continue back finishing with our weather forecast. Today on Tuesday, temperatures will be in the mid-50s with a 60% chance of rain around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. For WALK News, I'm Caitlin Finnerty signing off on your broadcast. Make sure you catch up with us on tomorrow's broadcast. Thank you so much. When asked the question, are you a criminal? Your answer probably shouldn't be, well, I might be, even if you might be. When being pulled over by the cops, do not pull down your pants and pressure black behind to the window as some form of identification. These are all bad ideas. The kind of bad idea, like, shouldn't you know better? Who does that anyway type of bad idea? Growing up, I was one of a kind. I never knew many people that looked like me personally, but I knew them from their mugshot shown in the news. There are over 70,000 more African Americans in the U.S. prison system than there were slaves in the 1850s. That's because the system cannot fail those who it was never meant to protect. We are not criminals, a poetry program. So this one here is from my county cousins, currently incarcerated for crimes committed and or confessed, contributing to the new Jim Crow, my county cousins. Not to be confused by my country cousins currently in Kansas cooking cornbread and collard greens in the kitchen, nah. Those cousins you see every summer. These cousins you see every quarter century. In county, constantly making collect calls, inquiring about commissary curse to forever circulate in and out of this country's industrial prison complex. I've heard the way you talk about young black people. <laughs> you say, how can they be so angry? How? How can they be so loud? Which to me sounds like, how can they be so brave? How can they laugh and sing and dance and love with such dangerous skin hanging from their bones? Don't they know they are not safe here? Don't they know this world is so, so hungry? I don't remember the exact moment I learned silence. Maybe it was the quiet game. Maybe it's always made sense to me that the winner is the one that keeps his mouth shut, that the survivors never wore their skin too loudly. Maybe it was time. Maybe it was decades of tiptoeing around in my own skin, praying that the world wouldn't remember how easy it is to swallow a black boy whole. It took me 18 years to find God in the darkness, to realize that I don't need light skin in order to be the sun, that I am the sun of African kings and queens, of a heritage so deep, so wide, it scared the world. And you, you want to take this from me? You, you want to strip me clean, bleach away the parts of me that make you feel uncomfortable? That make you confuse me for target, for gun? Somewhere for you to put a bullet, we are not the same. When white ancestors put a boot to my neck, I don't get to pretend it's not there. The answer to racism is not in forgetting the past. The past is not the only place it exists. I think I learned silence when I realized that everyone around me was hungry. That the applause and the insults thrown at my skin were actually the sounds of growling stomachs waiting impatiently for a meal. I learned silence every time I was patted on the back for not being one of those black people, for not wearing my pants like they were being weighed down from a heavy heart. My cousin used to wear busted jeans to Grandma's Christian church in Chatham. My cousin was cool enough to make almost any girl crack a smile with the same cousin. 
I saw clinching, clutching, raised on sight of his brother's gun on concrete, make that gun cry for days of cow, cow. Then one day, a crooked Chicago cop came and cased my cousin before college. Now my family only congregates in courtrooms. I can hear the jury concluding caucus that would decide his fate, but I can't concentrate. I think I learned silence when I realized I don't have to say anything. How many times have I opened my mouth only to hear someone else's voice? How many times? Have I realized that this body is not my own? That I'm never going to be anything than who you've already decided I am? All I can do is think about when we were kids. I used to play cops and robbers on the corner and the pleasure I got each time my cousin was caught and placed in imaginary cuffs and now guilt creeps my conscience. For I am no different than these cops for how willing I am to make criminal out of my kids. The color of our skin carries so much weight. I can understand why you want to set it down. But you're asking me to pretend. Pretend like we're all born with a blank slate. Pretend like some things haven't already been chosen for me. You're asking me to do something I've never had the privilege to. Blindness is never a solution. Don't you dare close your eyes. Look at me. Look at me and tell me what you see. I think I learned silence like I learned survival. Like I learned camouflage, like I learned hiding in plain sight, like I learned being the cool black guy. The cool black guy that laughs at the racist jokes, that doesn't dirty clear skies with black fists. The cool black guy that knows that being black <laughs> is no way to live. Not even Godfrey could convince me my cousin's capable of killing anyone. You could have thought that before my cousin could finesse the 18th candle or convince clocks and calendars to give him the combination to eternity, that this body will become a combination of tears because now my mama cry and, and his mama cry and my brother tried to tell her it would be okay and she hit him. I said, auntie, please keep your hands off him. Quit your crying because better he be in county than in a casket. So remember when asked the question, are you a criminal? Know that the verdict has already been decided. Your dark skin was a pre-existing condition. When being pulled over by the cops, rehearse the names of black lives, turn gravestone, put your hands on the wheel, and don't make any sudden movements. These are all bad ideas. You should know better. When 2012 presidential candidate Mitt Romney decided that he was going to be running for the Senate as a senator from Utah, he figured that securing the Republican nominee in nomination would be pretty easy. Yet it has proved to be quite the opposite, in fact, with Romney not actually getting the 60 percent that he needed in order to get the nomination and now having to face something he never thought he would have to, a Republican primary. And so when asked the question today, is Mitt Romney's r Senate primary for the senator of Utah a mere formality? I had to answer not necessarily, because he doesn't have the support of all GOP party members in Utah. We can examine this through three main areas of study. First, by looking at the fact that GOP members were quite split upon who should get the nomination. Next, by looking at the fact that Romney c committed a taboo of the GOP party by collecting signatures. And finally, by exploring the fact that Romney is a harsh critic of Donald Trump, which may prove to be a detriment towards his case. So first, let's take a look at the fact that the GOP party in Utah seems to be quite split about who should actually be getting the nomination when it comes to it. 
The state of Utah is one that is mainly Republican and one that has many conservatives who are, in fact, quite aligned with Mitt Romney's agenda. And so Mitt Romney clearly believed that he would be able to secure the nomination, and yet it was quite the opposite. Mitt Romney needed 60% of votes in this primary caucus in order to try in order to get the nomination without having to go through a series of primaries. And yet Mitt Romney only got 49% of votes, according to CBS News, as of April 21st. And so what we can see here is that Mitt Romney wasn't actually that close to even securing the nomination. He didn't even get the majority of votes among the party in Utah. And so with this, it seems as though the primaries aren't going to be a formality. If his other major opponent, Mike Kennedy, was able to get 51% of votes, it seems as though some conservatives in Utah are looking towards other people than simply Romney. Another thing that we must consider is the fact that this caucus that got Mitt Romney 49% wasn't even the first caucus. According to CNN, as of February 22nd, they actually had to hold multiple caucuses before they could even get one where someone got more than 50% of votes, with, uh, with Kennedy ultimately getting 50.88% of votes. And so with this, again, we can see that the GOP seems to be quite divided. And if they truly are unified behind Romney, then he would have been able to secure the nomination. But with them being so divided, it seems as though the waters are not going to be clear for Romney to easily secure this nomination. And this is not a mere formality. Next, let's take a look at the fact that one of the biggest mistakes that Mitt Romney committed might have been the reason that he did not secure this nomination. And that was the fact that he decided to collect signatures. One option for someone who is deciding to run for an office is to try and collect signatures in order to get their name on the ballot. And Romney decided to do this, collecting 28,000 signatures. But Romney even, even indicated that he, this may have been a mistake on his part, according to the Salt Lake Tribune as of April 21st. The reason for this? The Republican Party heavily looks down upon the act of collecting signatures. According to the New York Times, as of April 21st, many GOP party members believe that collecting signature is trying to undermine their credibility as trying to nominate someone by trying to get rid of a true nomination system. Essentially, what they believe is that Romney is more focused upon actually securing the nomination through any means possible than having the major support of party members in the state of Utah. And so with this, we can understand that some party members are going to be hesitant to support Romney if he didn't put his faith in the system of simply getting enough votes in a caucus to secure the nomination, but instead decided to get signatures. And finally, let's take a look at what may turn out to be one of Mitt Romney's biggest faults. And that is the fact that he is an opponent of Donald Trump and has been a harsh critic of Trump, despite the fact that they are both in the same party. Mitt Romney has been someone who has been critical of Donald Trump essentially since the beginning of Donald Trump's political career. He has been very outspoken and would ultimately prove to be someone who may actually get in the way of Donald Trump's agenda, according to The Atlantic as of April 6th. And so with this, some conservatives in Utah may not actually want to vote for Romney because he could get in the way of Donald Trump achieving what he hopes to do and therefore could actually prove to be an opponent of the Republican Party in the White House rather than an ally and another member of the party. R Mitt Romney has actually gotten Donald Trump's endorsement as a Senate candidate, yet Mitt Romney has continued to be quite critical of Donald Trump's actions and still has not claimed whether or not he would support Donald Trump's presidential campaign in the year 2020. This is something that is important to consider when considering the fact that he is running in the state of Utah because the state is so supportive of Donald Trump, according to the Washington Post as of March 6th. And so with this, we can understand that this is going to cause the Republican Party to become even more split about whether or not they want to support Mitt Romney, ultimately because he may pose to be an opponent of the president that they so heavily support. And so when asked the question today, is Mitt Romney's Senate primary in Utah simply a formality? I had to answer no, 
because of the fact that some GOP party members seem to not actually support Romney and there's quite a bit of division. We were able to understand this through three main areas of study. First, by looking at the original caucuses and how GOP party members seem to be quite divided. Next, by looking at the fact that Mitt Romney committed a cardinal sin of the Republican Party by deciding to collect signatures for a nomination. And finally, by exploring the fact that Mitt Romney is a harsh critic of Donald Trump and may ultimately get in the way of Trump achieving his agenda. And so when Mitt Romney decided that he was going to run for a, for a Senate seat in the state of Utah, he may have figured that the waters would be smooth sailing from there, but the Republican Party, the Republican primaries in Utah may ultimately pose to show that this is not going to be the case. Thank you. Silent nights, holy nights, all is calm, all is bright. Oh, 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 I'm sorry about my voice. Oh, sometimes I get a little, I'm a carried away when I sing. And I think it's because I don't want to forget the, uh, the tunes of my favorite songs. <laughs> oh, well, I haven't always been this way. Deaf, I mean. Oh, uh, my name is Darwin Alexander Denon, and uh, I like um, playing frisbee, the, the color orange. Uh, oh. <laughs> And, uh, and my Snoopy. And I love Christmas and, uh, oh, and my sister, Holly. It has been said by some that the greatest gift you can give to others is the gift of unconditional love and acceptance. It is often that in our society, we fail to see past the flaws of others, or even ourselves. However, at the end of the day, we must come to terms with the idea that it is our faults that make us human. So through this story, we meet Darren, a young boy who is both cognitively disabled and deaf, as he learns that before you can accept love from others, you must first love yourself. Silent Nights of Firefly Lights by Eric Benson. Holly was born at, at 1.25 in the morning on Christmas. Oh, oh, and I remember because the first time mom let me hold her, my, oh, my entire heart moved up to my throat. I, I mean, she was so light. <laughs> like a Christmas ornament. <laughs> um, you see, the way I see it, the uh, holly completes me. <laughs> She's like all the stuff I'm missing. <laughs> the brains and eels for both of us. <laughs> I think I lost all of my cognitive hearing when I was 11. <sighs> I was outside counting fireflies with holly and I... <laughs> And you know, it was kind of sudden. <laughs> like, like, like all of a sudden, the, 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 the crickets just stopped chirping. And, and Holly was singing this song, and her lips were moving, but, but, but nothing was coming out. And so I told her, and I guess she started singing really loudly. But, oh, but I couldn't hear her. You know, it was just this silent night. Full of firefly light. And I told my parents, and they took me to the hospital. <laughs> and I was uh, really scared. Um, but, but, but Holly held my hand the entire way there. And, and in my mind, I thought Santa must be the best guy in the world for giving me a Christmas present like this. 
I wanted to make Holly the best Christmas present in the entire world. The only thing was is that I had to uh, convince my parents to leave the house. Oh no, just for a couple of hours uh, because I knew it might get really loud and I didn't want to annoy them. The big day had come and I had spent weeks preparing. I uh, made Holly SpaghettiOs. Well, she made them and I sort of just watched her. And then we went upstairs. And I set her bath and told her that I was going to be right back. And so I went to my room. And my big surprise was to sing all of Holly's favorite Christmas songs for her. And so I pressed record. And silent nights rocking around the Christmas tree. And, and even do you hear what I hear? Which is kind of ironic. Oh, and the time must have passed me by because the next time I looked at the clock, it was 8.45, and I started singing at 7. Oh, Holly must be a big prune by now. Oh, Holly, I have a surprise for... Oh, Holly, there's water all over the... Oh. Oh, no, why? Does she look like that? Uh, uh, you know, her, her head was under the water. Um, uh, Holly, it's time to wake up now. Holly. Uh, Holly, wake up. Holly. Holly. Holly, wake up. Holly, Holly, wake up right now or, or you're gonna be in big... No. Oh no, this, this isn't right. You know, I may be slow and deaf and stupid and stupid and stupid, but this isn't what a little girl is supposed to look like. With silent eyes, only nice. Always calm. Always and so today I stand here in Holly's room. And you know, I can't change what I did. And I can't change how stupid I am, but, but, but I did bring the tape. I, I didn't know what else to do, and I, Oh, God. Merry Christmas, Holly. My mother's always been a huge worrier. She really wanted me to get out of the city, you know, go somewhere safe. So we ended up in Blacksburg, Virginia, a pretty little sleepy, safe town. And well, I immediately fell in love. One look and it was already decided. I was gonna be a Virginia Tech Hokey. Little did I know. Since 2013, there have been over 300 school shootings, averaging about one per week. Even before then, on April 16, 2007, a college campus collapsed into chaos as shooter Sung Wee Cho tore through Virginia Tech, wounding 23 and killing 32 people. Nearly over a decade later, mass shootings in America have become more commonplace than rarity. 
some of the most recent being in Lexington Park, Maryland, Birmingham, Alabama, and Parkland, Florida. If we are to move forward, we must acknowledge the gruesome nature of these acts and not only recognize that regulation and remembrance are key to controlling these crises, but that this can happen anywhere and to anyone. April 16th by Roldan Lazenby. I remember my first day alone in Blacksburg. It was around 2 p.m. and all new students were to meet in Lane Stadium. I didn't know where that was, so I just followed the masses. After what seemed like an endless number of speeches, the mic was given to the quarterback of the football team. He was tall and handsome. I mean, I, just like every girl, was lost in his smile. And then he started this chant. It was just three words, but the entire stadium erupted. Let's go Hokies. Let's go Hokies. And while my fear melted away, Virginia Tech was where I belonged. The morning of April 16th started off as a normal class. Nothing out of the ordinary. Fifteen minutes in, a kid opened the door slightly and peeked his head into the room. Something relatively normal, maybe a lost student. Fifteen more minutes, there was this burst of a repetitive noise, sort of like a, a construction noise, like hammers or nail guns. So we went back to our test, and I even remember being like, hey, how did they expect us to finish this test with all this noise going on? Then, something caught my attention out the window. A man. Everyone get off the quad! Get inside now! All of you, get inside now! You could smell the gunpowder, hear the screams. You begin to put two and two together. Shut up, shut up! I moved slowly towards the door, and I looked at the hall, and I saw the shooter coming right towards us. He, he walked in almost like a trance. He started raising his gun, so we threw ourselves back into the room. Everyone get down, he has a gun! I went into a cowering position, and then I realized we have to do something. There was nothing stopping this guy from just coming in. We need to barricade the door. He's coming for our classroom next. We were just four people pushing on the table. You could feel the bullets coming through the door, like you could feel the vibration of each gunshot. And he didn't stop until his clip was empty. I tried to remain calm, but my hands were frantically shaking. I called 911. There's a man with a gun shooting. Why aren't you here? The killer started again. Professor Labreth, you pushed us out of the way. And he stood in front of the door. He did not move. He would not move. He just stood there. And then the killer gained entry and shot our teacher at point blank range. I don't think me or my classmates would be alive if it wasn't for him. But as the barrel of the gun and the killer's eyes moved across the room, he briefly stopped on me. I saw into his eyes, you know. Sometimes you can look into a person's eyes and see their life story. But with his, there was nothing. All of a sudden, he started firing on the students. I saw bullets hit bodies. There was blood everywhere, disaster, chaos, people screaming and crying, sobbing out in panic. I didn't even feel the bullets that hit me in the chest and the arm. Faded in and out of consciousness. Sirens, flashing lights, voices everywhere. But then there were the cell phones ringing in the body bags as they carried out the victims. I saw faces of police officers who would later tell counselors that they had seen things that they just couldn't get out of their minds no matter how hard they tried. <sighs> the biggest shooting in history. This is a this is not a domestic dispute. I repeat, not a domestic dispute. <laughs> Looks like we have another Columbine on our hands. <sighs> what do you do when you wake up to the sound of your friend crying because she got the phone call confirming the death of her friend? What do you do? 
when you can't get a hold of your brother who lives in the hall? What do you do when you realize that your former French teacher who used to play French techno music videos on Fridays and your peers, Austin, Caitlin, Daniel, Aaron, and Matt are dead? You think, why? And you watch TV for eight hours just to hear the same news. You check Facebook profiles, you reflect, and you remember every stupid, careless, selfish thing you've ever done. The candlelight vigil gave us the opportunity to mourn in our own ways, but together. And while together, it's the best way to be. The feeling of loss hit me at the ceremony with the releasing of the balloons. 32. It's just a number until you stand there and listen to 32 tolls of a bell and watch 32 balloons float away for each life lost. But our Hokie Nation is real and our bond is incredibly strong. We came together to cry, to hope, and to heal. And then the crowd began to cheer. Let's go Hokies. Let's go, Hokies. The repetition of those three simple words, well, they meant everything to us. People talk about April 16th being Virginia Tech's darkest hour. Well, I think in the hours after the shooting, those were Virginia Tech's finest hours. The way the whole community came together in the face of an awful, horrible tragedy. It reminded us that we can and we will recover in due time. <gasps> Excuse me, pardon me, move! I gotta check my grade, Callahan! D plus? Oh my god. I passed! I'm gonna graduate! I gotta tell my dad! Richard Hayden? Why did my dad send a secretary to pick me up? Um, assistant, and he was at the airport this morning, but you weren't on the plane. And would you mind not eating in the car, please? It's kind of a rule. <gasps> oh, son of a- Chocolate all over my suit! Mm. Oh, I can actually hear you getting fatter. Shut up, Richard. Tommy Callahan is a childish, overweight bonehead with no sense of direction. Richard Hayden is a skinny, sarcastic little prick with no friends. When Tommy is forced to take on a sales job for his father's failing auto parts company, they embark on a crazy road trip together to save it in Tommy, Tommy Boy, Boy, written by Terry and Bonnie Turner. Maybe instead of taking on a loan, you should take on a partner. No, this has and always will be a family firm. Someday my son will run it. Selling brake pads is an interesting idea, Mr. Callahan, but I'd like to take a look at your operation before my bank can give you a loan. Fair enough, Mr. Wilson. Of course, I can get a hell of a good look at a T-bone steak by sticking my head up a bull's ass, but I'd rather take the butcher's word for it. Ha ha ha! Bull's ass! Good one, Dad! Tommy boy! <gasps> I'm proud of you, Mr. Big Time College Grad, huh? Oh, thanks, Dad. How's about we go home and I show you that surprise? <sighs> Holy shnikes. Is she for me? No, son, she's for me. Tommy boy, this is my bride-to-be, Beverly. She's going to be your new stepmom. Oh, Tommy, aren't you a doll? My son Paul's coming in today for the wedding. <sighs> You're getting married? And I'm getting a brother named Paul? And, um... Brother! Hello, I'm Paul. Tommy, I presume. Brothers don't shake hands! Brothers got a hug! Please don't. Come here! I can't believe I have a new brother! This is great! Yes, great. So is there anything... dangerous to do in this town? Oh. So you mean like... TREASON! Did you eat a lot of paint chips as a kid? <laughs> Why? Man, that wedding was awesome. Have the towns at your reception. You look great, Dad. You look good too, Tommy boy. Listen, this marriage thing. You know, ever since your mom died, it's something about being alone. Dad, it's cool, you know? I just want you to be happy. And I am, kid. You know, all these years and working for this company and the hours put in, it was all for you, Tommy boy. And when you're running this place someday, I know you'll make me proud. Dad? Dad? <gasps> Dad! No! Someone call 911! Dad. Ladies and 
gentlemen. Big Tom will be dearly missed. But as acting president of Callahan Auto, I must say that we're in big trouble, comrades! Razoritsky wants to buy us out and we need options! Wilson, you're a banker. Your thoughts? Riley, if we sell now while our values are still high, we can still stand to make great money for our shareholders. That includes Tommy and, of course, the new Mrs. Callahan. Damn it, Wilson! I don't want to hear the word sell again! It seems vulgar to talk about money at a time like this! I hate to say this, but when Big Tom died, Callahan Auto may have died with him. You know, my dad cared about these brake pads, and so do I. What are you saying, boy? I'm going on my dad's sales trip to save this company. But tell me you don't know the first thing about brake pads. No, I don't know much about this stuff, but... Richard does! Oh, no. Yeah, Richard is my dad's right-hand man! This is crazy. He knows more about brake pads than anyone in here! Time out! Bad idea! There's no way! Okay, Tommy, I'm here against my will, so the least you can do is pretend to work. Now it's sales time, remember? We don't take no- Crap from anyone! No. We don't take no prisoners? We don't take no for an answer. Right. No. Okie dokie. No. Sounds good. No! Thank you for your time. Maybe, but first I'd have to come by and take a look at your new operation. Uh, I'll tell you what, I can get a good look at a butcher's ass by sticking my head up there, but I'd rather take his word for it. <laughs> oh. Man, there's nothing on TV in this stupid hotel. Hey, Richard, it's him! America, if you need anything screwed or glued in that car of yours, come see old Ray Zelinsky. I make car parts for the American working man because that's who I am. And that's who I care about. I love you, Ray! I love you, too! He seems nice. Wow. You're dumber than I thought. That nice guy wants to buy Callahan and we haven't made one sale. If we don't sell half a million brake pads in the next ten days, the factory goes under. Maybe if we didn't have to stop at every other exit for you to get drive through. Okay, that's it! It's go time! Me and you! Oh, I'm gonna wail on you, Porky! Come on, I'll give you a free shot! Duh! Oh, you can do better than that! Duh! Oh, if I wanted a kiss, I would have called your mother. Ah! Oh, that was a good I swear to God, you're worthless! Don't call me worthless! I'm trying, okay? I'm not my dad! That's right, you're not your dad! I learned everything I know from him! I didn't have a father, and he looked out for me, but you! He was your real dad, you just took him for granted. Hey, I'm Big Tom's son. He'll fix everything, so I'm allowed to be a moron! You know, I care about stuff, Richard. I'm getting better at this sales thing. Okay, I'm not, but I could if you help me. Forget it. I have enough to do without having to change your diapers. Ah, my dear Beverly, this is working out far better than we planned. I thought it would take a year to plead Big Tom in a divorce settlement. Instead, he croaks and you own half the company. Now all we have to do is sell it to Zelensky. The only thing keeping us poor is Tommy and his stupid sales trip. Don't worry, my beautiful, sexy wife. Oh, nobody will buy from that blimp. Oh, waitress, me and Richard will have the chicken wings, please. Kitchen's closed till dinner. Oh, bummer, you sure it's closed? Let me check. Yup, it's closed. What's your name? Helen! Oh, you uh, sure look like a Helen. Now, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. So let's say I go into some guy's office, and let's say he wants to buy something. Well, then I get all excited. I'm like Jojo the Idiot Circus Boy with a pretty new pet. And my new pet is my possible sale. So I stroke it, and I pet it, and I love my little naughty pet. You're naughty! <laughs> and then I take my naughty pet, and I... <laughs> oh, I killed my sale! And that's when people like us have to forge ahead. You know what I'm saying, Helen? God, you're sick. I'll tell you what. I'll go throw some wings in there for you. Thanks, Helen. Did that kick to the bells knock something loose? What? You just pulled a 180 with that waitress. Why can't you sell like that? I was just having fun. You got the wings because you had confidence, and that's what it takes to sell. Your dad had that. Yeah, but my dad was smart. I'm not. Very true. But there are two types of smarts. Book smarts, which waved bye-bye to you long ago, and their street smarts. The ability to read people. Maybe you're right, Richard. <sighs> yes. Okie dokie. Uh-huh. Sounds good. Sure thing. Thank you for your time. No, it's just a couple of sales, Paul. It's not the end of the world. We got it. Every factory needs trucks. We stop the trucks. We stop Tommy Boy. <sighs> I think that last sale just put us over the mark. We saved the factory? We saved the factory. We're selling the factory. What? The trucks delivered wrong parts to wrong cities. There's gotta be something we can do. Half the orders have already been canceled. And now we have to sell to Zelensky. Wait, Zelensky, he's the answer. Richard, you and I go to Chicago. Tell Zelensky we're not for sale. He seems like a nice enough guy on TV. He'll understand. Hell, if it doesn't work, we lose the factory anyway, right? Chicago? Chicago. 
Zelensky's office. I can't believe we're doing this. Bring, bring. Hello? Tommy, I must speak with you. Riley? Okay, I was at the office and I saw your stepbrother and your stepmother and he was kissing her. So? With his tongue. What? It turns out they're married. Con artist, I tell you. I send you police reports. <sighs> they suckered my dad. Okay, I have a plan. <sighs> your future's right through this door. Come on, Tommy boy. I'm here to save the- Oh, son of a- I'm here to save the factory! Wait a minute, fat boy. You lost your shares to the bank. You don't have a right to be here. Oh, really? Mr. Zelensky, my name is Tommy Callahan. I've seen you on TV. What is it your commercials say again? I make our parts for the American working man because that's who I am. And that's who I care about. What's the love you, Ray? Somebody get this guy out of here. What are you doing here, kid? Well, you see, back in Sandusky, Ohio, there are thousands of Callahan auto workers who are in danger of losing their jobs. This is in order for half a million Callahan brake pads to be sold in your stores, made by and for the American working man. I'll be happy to look into it. Well, I'll tell you what, I can get a good look at a T-bone steak by sticking my head up a bull's ass, but I'd rather take the butcher's word for it. <gasps> so what do you say? Yeah, absolutely. A great American product, right? Now wait just a minute. I still own half of Callahan and I want to sell to Zelensky. Gee. Funny you should bring that up. What have we got here, Tommy? A police report? Paul Barish married to Beverly Burns. Now, how can Beverly be married to Paul and your dad at the same time? Well, I think that means that Beverly's marriage to my father was never legal. What? Which means all of her shares ultimately belong to me. <laughs> and Mr. Zielinski, I can't save the factory. It's not what my dad would have wanted. Good luck, Tommy boy. Hey, did you eat a lot of paint chips as a kid or something? Why does everyone keep saying that? <laughs> well, Richard. The factory saved. Paul and Beverly are in jail. I just hope my dad would have been proud of me. Of course your dad would have been proud of you. And you got a friend out of it. Now I know it doesn't matter because you have so many, but uh, I don't. Great job today. Richard. No. Brothers don't shake hands. Tommy. Brothers got a hug. Aww. Come here. Why? Shut up, Richard. Down here in Choctaw country, most folks will tell you that Chucky Rabbit is lazy. And then they'll say, shoop, and watch your food when Chucky Rabbit's around. Blink once and it'll all be gone, gone, gone. Shoop. Like this one time long ago, Miss Shukator Possum needed a new home. Several of her friends agreed on an everybody work together day to build her one. All except for Chuck Fee Rabbit. Chuck Fee, would you like to come help me build a house? Uh, listen to who's coming. <laughs> Need a bear. Giraffe Fox. Lopsy Turtle and Kenta Beaver. They'll all be there. Oh, uh -huh. I'm sorry, Miss Possum, but I'm much, much too busy that day. But, but I didn't even say which day. Oh, uh -huh. which day? Tomorrow. Ah, uh, yeah, much, much too busy tomorrow. Oh, that's too bad because I'm preparing my delicious homemade butter for everyone who comes. Oh, uh, butter? Uh, oh, wait, uh, I just remembered. Uh, it's the next day that I'm much too busy. Tomorrow I can most certainly be there. Well, that's just how Chick Fee Rabbit is. Sometimes people, well, in this case, animals, think it's okay to just accept the reward without doing all the hard work. Well, in this Native American folktale, Chuck Fee, a sly rabbit, tries to get away with all of his actions by pinning it on the other animals. Will the others realize that Chuck Fee was in fact lying? Or will Chuck Fee's mischievous plan succeed? Find out in Chuck Fee Rabbit's Big Bad Bellyache, written by Greg Rogers. Early the next morning, everyone showed up to Miss Possum's place. She had prepared delicious cornbread biscuits, oh, great dumplings, tonsula bona, which is a Choctaw kind of corn stew. Oh, and best of all, lots and oh, oh, lots of homemade butter. It was creamy and delicious, oh, and hard to make. A real treat. But all of that would have to wait for supper after the work was done. I'll do the sa sa sign. I'll do the ch ch dig dig digging. <laughs> Look, see, turtle and I shall do the ham ham hammering. I shall do the sweep sweep sweeping. And will Chuck Fee? Huh, 
Well, as usual, Chick Fee had disappeared. Chick, Chick, Chick Fee, uh, where are ya? From behind a pile of rocks, Chick Fee answered, uh, uh, over here, Chula. Well, uh, why aren't you working? <coughs> I'm sick, Chula. I, uh, I think I have a fever, but hey, don't worry, it'll pass soon enough. But this wasn't true at all. See, Chick Fee wasn't sick. He was just hiding. But when no one was watching, Chuck Fee would sneak down to the cold water spring <gasps> where the food was being kept. Then he took the tub of homemade butter and carried it back to his hiding spot behind the pile of rocks. He could hear the sawing, Miss Possum sweeping, and Chuck Chuck Chula's dig, dig, digging. Man, this work could take all day! So he took the lid off the tub of butter. Uh, and boy, was it full. Uh, he didn't want to wait till supper. He wanted to eat it right now. So he licked the top of the thick, creamy spread. Mm, so good. Just one more taste. Mm. They'll never notice. And then another, and another. Soon Chuck Fee stuck his paw deep into the tub of butter and oh, oh, a whole puffles in a tub. Chick, chick, chick Fee, uh, how's the fever? Uh, about halfway, Chula. Oh no, it was the middle of the afternoon and, and Chuck Fee had still not started working. Chick, chick, Chick Fee, uh, you fever gone yet? Almost gone, Chula. Yup, that's right. The tub was nearly empty. Chuck Fee scraped up the last bit of butter and whoop, slipped it into his mouth. Huh? He lay back on his pile of rocks though, his belly oh so full. But when he could move again, he took the tub of homemade butter back to the cold water spring. As the sun started to set down towards the end of the day, Chick Fee appeared from behind the pile of rocks. Okay, Miss Possum, I'm ready to work. Oh, Chick Fee, you're too late. The house is already done. Oh no, I'm so sad. I missed all the work. Oh, Chick Fee, that's okay. At least you're feeling better. Now, let's eat. So Miss Possum spread out all the food. She got out the cornbread biscuits, the grape dumplings, the tantula bona. But when she went to open the tub of homemade butter, she gasped. <gasps> Someone ate it all. Well, uh, it wasn't me. I was <coughs> sick all day. <laughs> that's true, but... But who? It could have been any of ya. All of us went down to spring to drink some water. It could have been any one of ya. <laughs> hey man, uh, it wasn't me. Not me. Not me. Oh, that's okay. I'll make some more butter next time. But for now, let's eat everything else. So they did, huh? Eat that is. After a while, everyone went down to lay for a nap. While they were sleeping, Chuck Fee noticed that he had a little bit of butter on the fur of his paw. He took it and gently rubbed it on Nita Bear's nose. When everyone woke up, Chuck Fee said, Hmm, why don't we check everyone's noses? Whoever ate it must still have it there. So one by one, Chula Fox examined their noses. Kinta, your nose is clean. Look, see ya, your nose is kinda dirty, but uh, certainly not buttery. But, uh, need a bear. Your nose is uh, shiny and uh, awfully greasy. Hey, man, uh, it does taste buttery, but I didn't eat any of it. Poor Nita. No one believed her. Oh, and they were mad. They pointed their fingers, paws, and claws at her. <gasps> you ain't told my butter. Chuck Fee had such a hard time not laughing at this. <laughs> to him, this was <laughs> so funny. But then, his tall tail belly began to shake and tremble. Before he could get his paw to cover his mouth, he let out a great big burp. Excuse me? But it was too late. Everyone had already smelled Chick Fee's big, bad, buttery breath. <gasps> it was you, no need to bear. You I told my butter. Let's get him. Chuck Fee tried to hop away, but his belly was too heavy. He tripped over his own floppy feet. Whoa! And rolled straight into the river. Chuck Fee might have escaped this time. And maybe, just maybe he learned his lesson. 
But that's okay though because Miss Possum did get a nice house and uh, everyone was real happy about that. As helping others is always more joyful than even the best butter ever. I've seen souls leap from project buildings in a single drop. Because who fears suicide? When your home looks a lot like hell and hell, who's going to save you? I know. It's going to have to be black Superman. Going to have to be me. Heroes. Fictional. Real life. Red cape. Blue badge. Black body. Because it seems if the color of your skin gets darker, the chances of you saving the day get slimmer. There is a price to pay to become a black hero. So this is a public piece for all the black boys and black girls who never got their comic book ending. Black super power. A poetry program. Ooh, ooh, me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Hi, my name is Tamir and I wanna be a hero. When I grow up, I wanna be a police officer. I, I, I. I got my first kill today. I see the silhouette of the enemy, of a child. No, when you're a soldier, you're taught that they're just silhouettes. They aren't real people. Five, four, three, put the gun to his head. Five, four, three, pull the trigger. And he's dead. If I walk out of this room tonight and they gun me down, tell the whole world I loved life. Tell them I held divinity in my smile, that I tried my best to get along with everyone, but tell them I had my limits. Tell them I was pushed, provoked for the black boys who said they were too dark to be the dark knight. Too colored to be the caped crusader, don't worry. Because there is a hero here who will avenge you. And then the Black Panther said, forget Batman. So you're calling yourself the Dark Knight. <laughs> really, bruh? Batman, you're what I'd be if I had like no powers. You let the whole world know that anyone can be a hero as long as you're born rich. It seems like privilege is the only thing super about you, wait. Wait, let me guess. You have hot sauce in your utility belt. You want to be me so bad. He, he knows the bad guy has a big gun, but he, he has a big heart. I want to be a hero. When I grow up, I want to be a teenage mutant ninja turtle. Wait, no, forget that. When I grow up, I want to be the first black Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. I mean, it's obvious they are already black. They say stuff like cowabunga and dude. But you, you don't have to worry about dying. I've tried to help the world when they were in their lowest lane, but every time they end my time, I, I had a dream once. I left it splattered on the balcony. Because whenever there's a black hero, the outcome is Malcolm X marks the spot where you get shot if they gun me down tonight. Tell them I was many things, and if they have to judge, then they have to understand life in a still shot. Tell them why I had my hands up in a still shot. Tell them I wasn't going out without a fight. Tell them I was a soldier, but I've been taught that there's no room for regret in the eyes of a soldier, so I've learned. How to stomach death like a predator, but still have life break lawn on the inside. They're just silhouettes, aren't they? Have you ever seen a bullet make two men become souls at the exact same time? But my soul be bonded with the panther god, inferior fist raised above heaven, they say. I might be a black Bruce Wayne in the making. I'm like, Nah, I am T'Challa, put some respect on my name, can't copy this King Cool to Charisma. Cam Newton meets Huey P. Newton in brains and in brawn because 
Have you ever seen a black man's outfit protect him from bullets? So if they gun me down tonight, tell them that I was young, gifted and black, I'll be named after a Renaissance artist too, I'll be Langston, the turtle with the pen. And I'll write verbally violent poems to all the evildoers in the world, like Shredder, the Rat King. This is the proverbial part of my story. I mean, I can get my powers any day. On November 22nd, 2014, a young black boy named Tamir Rice was shot down by Officer Timothy Lohman. No. No. Five, four, three, no. Put the gun to his head, no. No, five, no, four, three. Little black boy wanted to fly. Little black boy wanted a big red cape. This ain't no red cape I got on my back. This is a blanket smothered in the blood of black children. This S stands for struggle. This S stands for stolen, stands for sun suffocating so severely that something snapped for me. My family and country call me a hero. Do you know what they call a black man who wears a costume? A nigga. But do you know what they call a black man who wants to change things? A dead nigga. Be careful if you want to be Superman, they will put you in a crypt tonight. So if they gun me down tonight, this is not a cosplay and I, I'm not bulletproof. It's not about the color of your skin but the content in your character, so why can't you look like me and save the day? But this, this is how our heroes are made. We tell them this is what we do. It is the duty of a soldier to serve and protect everyone in his country except black people, I mean, silhouettes. I can't protect all of my people. Hell, I don't even know if I can protect myself. When they make a movie about me, there will be no whitewashing of black characters. My people have been drowning for far too long. There will be no mispronouncing of my name. I am T'Challa. It deserves to be learned just as much as my story. As a kid, I used to drive my mom absolutely crazy. Wherever we were going, I would want to know who was going to be there, what time we were leaving, what shoes I should wear, and it would make her insane. See, I always wanted to know everything. And what I learned throughout my life is that we can't always know everything but sometimes the process of understanding is what's even more important. This is what is said in Shay's quotation by James Thurber when he points out, it is better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. What is being said in Shay's quotation is that satiety is not always guaranteed with curiosity, but sometimes the process of reaching understanding is more fulfilling than the understanding itself. Now we can see this initially demonstrated by looking at the philosophy behind the religion of Buddhism. After this, we look at the failings of Common Core in understanding this. And finally, when we take a look at character Hermione Granger from the Harry Potter series. Now first, let's understand the philosophy behind Buddhism to really see how this philosophy of the importance of the process plays out. Buddhism is a religion that dates back thousands of years and focuses on not worrying so much about the end result, but instead enjoying the process. Buddhism focuses on reincarnation and the process of enlightenment, but what they understand is that if you're so focused on the end goal of reaching enlightenment, then you'll never ever truly reach it. 
because you'll never be fulfilled. Oftentimes what we learn on our path to enlightenment is what fulfills us. It's what makes us better people and it's what allows us to reach enlightenment. Similar to the way that James Thurber is describing how we can't always know all the answers. We can't always reach that end goal. But sometimes the process and the understanding and asking questions along the way is more fulfilling than the end result. When we are able to instead revel in the process and revel in everything that we gain from it, this is when we are able to achieve understanding in the end. Now, although this philosophy is understood by many, many still face challenges in it, especially in our education system. Common Core was a system that oftentimes failed in understanding that the end result isn't always the most important part of learning. Common Core was a style of learning focused much on test results and on scores, not on actual education or the process of learning. Because of Common Core, students were not only unable to really grasp content, but they were unhappy and weren't enjoying their education. You see, education in and of itself is a process, and unless students are given the liberty of enjoying that process, of making mistakes and finding different paths and forging new trails, then education won't be meaningful to them. If we are so focused on knowing all of the answers, on the end result, on where we're going to end up, then we'll actually pick up nothing along the way. Students today deserve more than simply focusing on what's going to happen at the end. And instead, they deserve the opportunity and the chance to take joy in the process of getting there. Now, a student herself who struggled with this in the fictional Harry Potter series was Hermione Granger. Hermione Granger was known for always wanting to know everything, whether it came to the actual material she was studying at Hogwarts or whether it came to a plan in being able to destroy Lord Voldemort. Out of the three members of the Golden Trio, Harry, Hermione, and Ron, Hermione was the one who was always pursuing knowledge. However, what Hermione would often get caught up in is being too focused on the end result. Oftentimes her failing was in not seeing the value in the journey. Throughout the journey of their years together, Harry, Ron, and Hermione learned so many valuable lessons. And if she had disregarded the process, as she so often was inclined to do, she would have never been able to benefit from it. And when she got to the end result of having defeated Voldemort, would have faced emptiness. Hermione teaches us, through her interactions with Ron and with Harry, that sometimes we simply have to slow our brains down and revel in the process and allow what we can learn from it to come to us naturally. So in the end, when we take a final look at today's quotation by James Thurber, it is better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. We can see as initially demonstrated through the philosophy of Buddhism. After this, when we take a look at Common Core and its failings in realizing this, and lastly, by looking at the journey of Hermione Granger, that although it's our inclination to want to know everything, Although we as human beings carry an inherent curiosity that can never really be solved, when we are able to let go of this control and instead enjoy the process of learning and the road to understanding, this is when we are not only the most content, but the most able to understand. A lesson I've learned throughout my life is that although we might not know everything, we can learn a lot. Thank you. My baby brother was born this morning. I know this because my dad woke me up in the middle of the night. He, he took me to my grandma's house and he told me I was going to be a big sister soon. So I told him, I don't want to be a big sister. <laughs> but apparently, I don't get a vote. Having a sibling can be tough especially when your older sister gets the bigger room, the brand new DS, or refuses to give you the last ticket to the Jonas Brothers concert even though none of her other friends can go. <laughs> anyway, having a sibling is hard. However, through the kicking, screaming, bickering, and fighting, in the end, it's truly worth it. Follow along as one little girl learns how to deal with her new addition to her family as she and her hamster, Leonard, try to figure out if babies ruin everything by Matthew Swanson. At Grandma's house, the TV is really small and the milk, 
taste weird. But my favorite part? <laughs> Sorry, Grandma. I guess you're not allowed to make yarn forts in the living room. Well, while well, Mom and Dad and the baby have a party at the hospital, I'm forced to stay at Grandma's and play checkers and eat cold oatmeal. <laughs> Goldilocks would not approve. But when Dad finally picks me up, he does not say hi to my hamster, Leonard. Instead, he tells me about 300 things I do not want to know. Hey, sport, you know, <laughs> the baby's head, it's huge. And it's really funny because he barely weighs anything. And hey, hey, listen, listen to this. <laughs> when he wrinkles his nose, I just die. And mom tells me I have to be nice to the baby. But it's very, very hard because the baby, he can't do one single useful thing. Like he can't stand on one foot. <laughs> he can't catch a frisbee. And he can't even whistle. Even big head Betty Hogarth can whistle. And he already lost his front teeth. Well, mom and dad decide to have a real party for the baby with balloons and streamers and pointy hats, ow! But the baby doesn't say thank you for the party. And the baby doesn't open his presents or eat his cake. So clearly there's something wrong with the baby. So I beg mom to send him back, but she just turns and says to me, now, hey now, hon, you know, he's just a baby after all. Well, they put the baby in my room. Now, he's very, very small, but he has a lot of stuff. Like right there, right there, right there. There's a poster of three pink kittens and a purple fuzzy walrus, right where my Types of Deadly Spiders poster used to be. And I explain to Mom and Dad that my room is too small for me, Leonard, and the baby, and that Maybe the baby should stay in the kitchen. But mom and dad do not agree. So the baby grows and he learns how to sit, but not very well. And he learns how to eat, but then he just gets his food all over the place. And he learns how to pick things up, but then he just throws them at me. Why am I? the only one who sees the truth. We need a better baby. So, <laughs> Leonard and I start a club for people who don't like babies, isn't that right, lady? But then mom says we have to let the baby join. So we start a club for people, moms, who don't understand how clubs are supposed to work. <sighs> the baby loses the keys to the car. And now no one can take me to Big Head Betty Hogger's birthday party. <laughs> I, I don't like Betty, of course, but I still want to go to the party because there they would have three different types of ice cream, a pinata shaped like a cowboy, and ponies. <laughs> I love ponies. Excuse me? Excuse me? Excuse me! Can we please get a better baby? Now, Buttercup, boop. <laughs> try to remember that he doesn't know any better. Try to remember <laughs> that he is just a baby. But he's not just a baby. He's an abomination, a creature from the deep. He, he wrecks my stuff, he cries at night, and he doesn't understand the importance of birthday parties. It is absolutely, certainly clear, without a doubt, Babies ruin everything! <laughs> and while I'm sitting in my room, minding my own business, guess who decides to come crawling in? What do you want? Huh? No one can even understand you. You know, you, 
you didn't eat you, your cake, you didn't open your presents, and now you're drooling on my floor! Someone needs to teach you some manners. Suddenly, I realize that maybe this baby just needs a better sister. So I try being nice to the baby, and we draw, and we draw, and we draw, and Mom gets mad at me for being nice. And I get sent into a timeout. <laughs> Mom may not see it, but this baby has potential. He's related to me after all. So I decide to teach him everything I know. I teach him about the planets and the months and the difference between frogs and toads and about every single type of truck I can remember. <laughs> The baby's pretty darn smart. He knows that I am the greatest sister in the world. So, the baby and I started a club for people who like marshmallows. And the baby and I want to go to the zoo. But mom says we can't go to the zoo because it's raining. But baby and I don't care. There's two of them and two of us. And no one is match for baby and me, so we go to the zoo. And it's raining. And the monkeys won't eat their bananas. And the baby, he cries and ruins everything, but I don't care. He's just a baby after all. I recently attended the funeral for a fellow member of my congregation. He was 20 years old and living at, in New York at the time, but regularly made trips home to us. However, the circumstances surrounding his death were very suspicious, and when an autopsy was done, it was found that he overdosed on heroin. We live in one of the worst affected areas of the opioid crisis. And when asked today's question, is the United States really doing enough to fight the rise of opioid use when we consider that President Trump made it the focus of his administration, we, look at, we can look at three main reasons why the government is not doing enough because they're focusing on only part of the issue. We can address this through three main points today. We can first understand the idea of prescription painkillers, only one form of opioid. We can then understand President Donald Trump's current work with the issue. And lastly, we can understand real solutions which the government needs to be addressing. What we can first understand is the usage of prescription painkillers in society and how this is only part of the issue. According to a Hill article on March 8, 2018, the government conducted a study in Virginia, one of the worst affected areas of the crisis, and found that if the government controlled prescription painkillers, this would not fix the issue. And when the government started to control, the control prescription painkillers and prescriptions that doctors used started to level out, according to an Associated Press article on February 26, 2018, the number of opioid overdoses still rose by 10%. This is important that we understand because this shows that opi prescription opioids are only part of the issue. A Business Insider article on July 9th, 2016 addresses the idea of illicit opioids being the worst part of the problem. This includes opioids such as heroin. It is essential that we understand that in the past 10 years, the crisis has grown to, to a point that it needs to be addressed now. Heroin usage has skyrocketed to roughly 300,000 new users in the past 10 years, and it is imperative that we fix this issue. However, since the government has failed to focus on this, they, we can see that they're not doing enough to address the opioid crisis. Furthermore, what we can understand is the idea of President Donald Trump's work, since he did make it the main goal of his administration. According to a Vox News article on October 26, 2017, in President Trump's campaign, he made it his main goal to fix the opioid crisis. And he did so on this date when he addressed the, when he addressed the United States, issuing a public health emergency on the opioid epidemic. However, in his address, when someone would typically point out the main problems and how to fix them, he presented no plan during his address, only making it a public health emergency. Furthermore, what we can explore is the idea that not only did he not have a plan, but he only addressed the issue when he asked for $1 billion from Congress to help fix this problem. A New York Times article on October 28th, 2017 states that if we want to fix the problem as a whole, we have to allocate $96 billion to the issue. 
it is imperative that we understand President Trump's work because not only did he make it the main goal of his administration to fix the opioid epidemic, but not only did he not ask for a plan, he only requested partial amounts of the funds. But lastly, he did this a year after he promised to fix, to fix the opioid epidemic. It is essential to note that President Trump made it his main goal. And if he really wanted to fix this issue and address the issue as a whole, he would have done it a lot sooner than taking a year to do it. And through this, we can see that how the government is not doing enough to fix the opioid epidemic and they're not addressing it, addressing it to the fullest extent. Lastly, if the government really wants to fix this issue, they would address real solutions, plausible problems to help fix the opioid epidemic. One possible way to do so is, is stated by a Fox News article on March 16th, 2018, stated that how the government can pass the CARA Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. This is an act that not only allocates more than $1 billion to address the opioid epidemic, but it also ad addresses the idea of recovery. And recovery is one of the best ways to help fix an, a drug addiction problem. Opioids such as heroin and fentanyl and oxycodone are the most addictive drugs, drugs as stated in the same news article. And if we want to address the issue, we can't address dealing it and we can't solely address those who are in possession of it, but we have to help people wane off the drug. We have to help people recover and so that they won't go back to this drug if they want to feel better. In addition, a Forbes news article on March 15th, 2018 states that lawmakers also need to look out for not only the recovery of the drug, but the treatment of those currently using the drug. We have to present plausible ideas for those to help wane them off the drug and make sure they don't go back to it. This act, this act addresses this issue and not only allocates funds, but sets forth plans to not only institute recovery institutions, but also institute whether it be healthcare or therapists that would help wane people off the drugs in a much better and comprehensive way. If President Trump and the government really wants to address the issue as a whole, they would look at this drug and they would support it more than, it's been, than it has been in Congress. And therefore, through this, we can see that because of their failure to address plausible solutions to the problem, other than allocating money to it, we can see how the government is not doing enough to fight the opioid epidemic. So today we understood three main trains of thoughts to understand how the government is not doing enough to fight the opioid epidemic. We first understood prescription painkillers and how the government's control of them are only one side of the issue. And if they really want to address the issue of a whole, they would also explore the idea of instituting control mechanisms on the usage of heroin in society. We were then able to understand President Trump's current work with the, with the opioid epidemic. Not only were we able to explore how it was his main goal of the administration when he was campaigning, but it took a year to address the problem as a whole and institute a public health emergency on the opioid epidemic. And lastly, we were able to understand real world solutions and a, a legislative act that would help the recovery and treatment of opioid victims. And how through this, we can see how President Trump's failure to support this in Congress and make it more well known to the public has caused him to not be able to address the, the issue as a whole and why the government is not doing enough to fight the opioid epidemic in America. Thank you. We are the window cleaners. We will polish your glass till it's shining like brass and it sparkles like sun on the sea. We are quick and polite. We will come day or night, the giraffe and the pelly and me. <sighs> the ladderless window cleaning company is in trouble. The pelican needs fish, the monkey needs nuts, and the giraffe can only eat the pink and purple flowers of the tinkle tinkle trees. Billy comes along to help and learns the value of friendship and the power of dreaming in The Giraffe and the Pelly and Me by Roald Dahl. There's this old wooden house that stands all by itself on the side of the road. And my mom told me it used to be a sweet shop. I've always longed and longed to own a sweet shop. One day when I was walking past, I noticed a new sign that had been tacked on the door. The Ladderless Window Cleaning Company. Hmm. Get your windows cleaned without any dirty ladders leaning against your house. Hello, boy. Hello, Mr. Uh, Pelican. Who's your friend in the next window? She's the giraffe. Isn't she lovely? How do you do? What's your name? Uh, Billy. 
And, as if all of that wasn't enough, another window popped open, and out jumped a monkey. <sighs> Whoa! Just then, a huge white Rolls Royce pulled up, and a chauffeur in a uniform stepped out. His Grace the Duke of Hampshire has instructed me to deliver this envelope to the Ladderless Window Cleaning Company. Dear sirs, I saw your notice as I drove by this morning. My home has 677 windows in it, and all of them are filthy. Kindly come and see me as soon as possible. Yours truly, the Duke of Hampshire. Billy, how do we get to this house? It's just over the hill. I'll show you the way. <laughs> wow. Just look at all those windows. They'll keep us going forever. Great Scott, who are you? Sir Duke, we are the window cleaners. Then who are you? He's our friend Billy. We go nowhere without him. Very well. Then come along with me and let's see if you're really any good at cleaning windows. It's all very simple, Your Grace. I am the ladder, the pelly is the bucket, and the monkey is the cleaner. Watch us go. And with that, the great window cleaning gang sprang into action. The monkey jumped down from the giraffe's back and er, turned on the garden tap. The pelican held his great beak open under the tap until it was full of water. Then, with giant springing leaps, the monkey began to climb up the long neck of the giraffe until at last he stood balanced on the very top of her head. Then, the most amazing thing happened. The giraffe's neck began to grow longer and longer and longer, until at last her head was level with the windows of the top floor. How was that? <sighs> Amazing! Remarkable! But just then, all of the window cleaners stopped dead in their tracks. Sir Duke, there is a man in one of the bedrooms on the third floor. He's, uh, he's opening all the drawers and taking things out. <gasps> he's got a pistol! By God, that's one of the Duchess's bedrooms. He must be after her jewels. Call the police. But even as he said that, the pelican was flying up into the air. What's that crazy bird up to? The pelican flew in through the open window. And five seconds later, emerged with his beak firmly closed. Pelly's done it. Pelly's got the burglar in his beak. Keep that beak closed, sir. Don't you dare open up, or he'll, he'll murder us all. Shake him up, Pelly. Teach him not to do it again. Mm. Just then, the Duchess came flying out of the house. Somebody's stolen my jewels. My diamond tiara, my diamond necklace, my diamond bracelets. I want my diamonds. Open your beak. Bird. Woo! Pow! Bang! Hold your horses, everyone. I and the rest of my police force are here to get that burglar out. Pelican, get ready to open up. Ah! Uh, great Scott! This is Cobra himself. He's the most dangerous burglar in the world. Those diamonds were worth millions, and you have saved them. So I hereby invite the giraffe and the pelican and the monkey to live on my estate for the rest of their lives. You may help yourself to the salmon river that flows through my estate and to the walnut and tinkle tinkle tree plantation. But what about you, Billy? Isn't there something that you desire? Yes, there, there is. 
there's this old wooden house that stands all by itself on the side of the road near where I live, and long ago it used to be a sweet shop. I've always hoped that someday someone might come along and turn it into a lovely new sweet shop again. Then we shall do it, and you, my boy, shall be the owner. It was amazing how quickly things began to happen after that. After three months, ding, 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 it was grand opening day, and the Duke stood outside in the road with the three best friends Billy ever had. I brought each one of them an extra special sweet as a gift to the Duke because it was cold outside. I brought some scarlet scorch droppers to the pelican, a big bag of pishlets. And to the monkey, some devil's drenchers. To the giraffe, I brought a bag of glorious glob gobblers. Delicious. I must leave you now. I have customers to look after in the shop. We must go too. We have 100 windows to clean before dark. But don't worry. No story ever ends when it's just you and your friends. The giraffe and a Pelly and me. If you're anything like me, thinking about safe drinking water is not something that I think about every single day. But I know that you probably turned on the tap this morning to brush your teeth. Last night, I put way too many hot peppers on my pizza and gulped down water straight from the tap. For all of us here, access to safe drinking water is not something that we have to think about. But did you know that three years ago in Charleston, Virginia, more than half a million people went without water for four days because industrial chemicals contaminated it? Closer to home, Flint, Michigan is still suffering. In 2014, its water supply was contaminated with lead from aging pipes and is said not to be fixed till at least 2020. This got me thinking about safe drinking water, what makes it clean and how safe is our supply to contamination. Today, we will refresh ourselves as to how the water cycle works, ripple through how water becomes safe to drink, and identify the issues that threaten to swallow up our safe water supply. So is thinking about safe water a waste of time? I mean, are the incidents in Flint and Charleston isolated ones? The World Health Organization tells us they are not. Nearly half of the world's population, 4.5 billion people, live within 30 miles of an impaired water resource. The New York Times reported in May of 2017 that there was a one in four chance that our supply is contaminated. The Natural Resources Defense Council reported that nearly 77 million Americans live where their water supply is in a violation of safety regulations. To understand where we get water in the first place, let's quickly backstroke into our elementary school years and review the water cycle. Evaporation starts the cycle. The sun heats water from lakes, oceans, and rivers, and the water evaporates back into the air, turning it into vapor. This is evaporation. As this vapor rises, it cools, turning back into liquid, forming clouds. This is called condensation. When the clouds become too big and heavy for the air to hold them, they fall back to the ground as rain, sleet, or snow. This precipitation is collected in riverbanks, oceans, and lakes, and mankind figures out a way to collect it and use it. But safe drinking water does not just come from nature and our faucets. It must be treated before it is safe to drink or use. The treatment plan can be simplified into these five basic steps. The first step is coagulation. Chemicals added to fresh water attract impure particles that stick together and form heavy sediment that sinks to the bottom of collection tanks. In step two, this sediment gets discarded. Step three is filtration. Here, fine particles missed during the first two steps get filtered out. While in step four, chlorine and other disinfectants are added to the water to kill organisms and bacteria that may still remain. While in step five, the water chills in pipes and reservoirs before it is brought safely to us. So if we have an infinite supply of naturally produced fresh water, 
and the technology to make it safe, then where is the breakdown? According to renowned science professor James Salzman, the same very three things have threatened our water supply since the time of the Roman aqueducts. Now let's take a look at each one. First, there are natural contaminants. Fresh water contains viruses, parasites, and bacteria. 100 years ago, waterborne typhoid and cholera were a common cause of death and still cause many epidemics in some places today. First world countries, like the U.S., have eliminated these threats by the treatment plan that I previously described. While third world countries, on the other hand, must look for a cheap shortcut in how they treat and pump their water. The European-based company LifeStraw has helped out by creating a portable filtration system that has nearly eliminated erad disease in countries like India, South Africa, and Kenya. But as we have seen in Flint and in other places, keeping water safe is not just about what we use to treat it. Municipalities that are faced with aging water treatment facilities must look for a shortcut in how they pump their water. This sadly backfired when in Milwaukee, 69 residents died when a treatment plant pumped contaminated water into their homes. This issue is now getting national attention. The American Society of Civil Engineers reported that the 15 agencies that oversee water safety and delivery have proposed a $2 trillion infrastructure upgrade over the next 10 years. This will only raise our infrastructure rate from a D-plus to a B. The second category of threats to our fresh water supply is by intentional acts. Professor Salzman explains that poisoning the enemy is a common warfare tactic. In 1941, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was concerned of the vulnerability of our natural water supply to Japan and Nazi Germany. Today, we have over more than 75,000 dams and reservoirs, with over 160,000 drinking water treatment facilities. This is over 2 million miles of pipeline that is almost impossible to keep away from potential terrorists. But the sheer size of our water supply means that poisoning it would not be easy. A few drops of cyanide in a single glass can kill, but it would take truckloads to poison an entire reservoir. Our Department of Homeland Security keeps a close eye on chemical substances that might be attractive to a terrorist. The last and final threat to our freshwater cycle is human error. Yes, accidents do regularly happen that can threaten to swallow up our water supply. Chemical tanks leak, trains derail, and recently in Florida, a sinkhole opened up, seriously contaminating its water supply. An employee noticed the problem, but failed to notify residents for nearly three weeks. The list of possible accidents are endless, but the protection against these accidents come from local government monitoring and detection programs. But some methods are shockingly simple. The town of Loveland, Colorado, keeps a drinking tank full of trout. If the trout start to die, the investigation begins. In other places, like New York City, multiple water samples are taken around the Big Apple every single day. And yes, there are other threats to our water supply beyond the three that I've spoken about. The destruction of rainforests, use of toxic fertilizers, pollutants, and population explosion all threaten our freshwater cycle. And climate change increases the frequency of droughts, floods, heat waves, and devastating storms that can threaten our freshwater cycle. Today, we have seen that the process that gives us easy access to safe drinking water is not as simple as turning on the tap. Clean water is made possible due to the protection of our natural water cycle and the investment in infrastructure, treatment, and constant monitoring for contamination. Wow, all that research has sure made me thirsty. I know that I will never take this for granted ever again. I just want to have a good time Can I have fun for the rest of my life? Just go where the wind goes I'm an artist, and I won't change a word in my play for some Broadway audience. I'm not arguing with you. Your play's great, but David, it's too heavy. Uh, maybe if you got a big-time investor interested. Ellen, you're my girlfriend and I love you, but you know nothing about this business. I've been through this twice before. Two powerful scripts. I know, I know, you're an artist. But it's the real world out there, and it's a lot rougher than you might think. Here he comes, here he caught my eye. Yeah, I love the moonlight. Just go where the wind blows. Do -do -do. Look at her up there. I mean, she's just got everything stars are made of. Yeah, 
She's great. Don't you think she'll be a star, Cheech? Not a doubt in my mind, Mr. V. I just want to have a good time. Can I have fun for the rest of my life? Just go where the wind blows. Bullets over Broadway, Broadway by Woody Allen and Douglas McGrath. I am fed up. I'm fed up. Do you hear me? I am not sharing a dressing room. None of these bimbos knows how to dance. Olive, come on. It's our anniversary. It's not our anniversary. It's September 28th. Six months. I remember it like it was yesterday because that's the one we broke Joey Benjamin's leg. Six months? And I'm still stuck in this crummy rat trap? I came to New York to be an actress. Well, be a great actress. Now, come on. Get yourself dressed. I got some exciting news for you. I have a surprise for you. Not now, Ellen. I've got a lot to do. Oh, David, you've been working on your play for years now. Let's get out of here. Go back to Pittsburgh, <sighs> get married, again. have Ellen, kids. Ellen, if you're gonna come in here and try to- Look, I may have found someone to fund your show, but you're not gonna- What? Like How? Nick Valenti, but he says his girlfriend has to have a part. You really don't understand my work, do you? Nick Valenti. How do I know that name? Oh, well, he may or may not be affiliated with the mob. Really, Ellen? You really thought I'd be okay with that? It doesn't have to be the lead. Who do you see as the lead? I don't know. I've always seen Eden Brent's the other woman, but... What about Helen St. Clair? She's a major actress. Was. I mean, she'd be great. Really, she's brilliant. You think we can get her? No! Miss St. Clair, please, you're perfect for the part. You must be joking. You want me to play some frumpy housewife who gets dumped for a flapper? I'm Helen St. Clair. I never play frumps. Or virgins. Uh, I can't handle this. I haven't had a drink since New Year's. We're talking Chinese New Year's? Naturally. Still, that's two days. Do you know how long that is for me? Helen, listen to me. This is a major part in a series play. And let's face it, you haven't been in a hit in a while. I have to be built over the title. Well, of course. The star's dressing well, this room. This is not even a question. Maybe there are a few ways you could find to brighten her up. Hmm? Hey, you said this was the lead. It's a smaller part. Ellen says you're a doctor. I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be the lead. A head doctor. It's a big part. Just charm him a little. Yeah, you're the one that needs charm lessons. David, how are you? Hello, I'm Olive. James, James, James. I read your play. It's thrilling, turbulent. A page turner. Mm, great. So, what have you been in, Miss, uh... Olive. Olive. Call me Olive, honey. Well, she ain't got experience, except she used to wiggle at this joint. She'd pick up quarters off the tabletops with her... Hey! But out, why don't you? He drinks. <laughs> so you've never acted before? Oh, yes, yes, I've acted. I've acted a lot. Actually, I was in a musical review. I had two thrilling show-stopping numbers. You tell Masucci he don't play ball or I'll chop his legs off. Is this a bad time? I feel like this is a bad time. Oh, don't pay any attention to Nick. I told him to go make some horse d'oeuvres. What? Well, horse d'oeuvres. You know, like cheese and crackers. No, no, I know what hors d'oeuvres are. I'll cut his throat. I'll come down there and pull his guts out through his windpipe. You hear me? So, do you like the play? <laughs> it's sad. Well, it's a tragedy. You burn it down, Cheech. Make it look like arson. Uh, sorry you guys had to hear that. Some problems with the firm. I'm feeling a bit unstable. I think I might go check myself into a sanitarium and get the help I need. And we'll talk later because it's been good. Well, this is going to be a big event on Broadway. Absolutely not. No. You know she never acted before. You know that, right? Oh, except for her... Two thrilling show-stopping numbers. David, if you want to get your plan, you may have to make some sacrifices. Life isn't perfect. Olive starts rehearsal for a show next week, and I want you to keep an eye on her. Make sure they treat her right up. Yeah, look, Mr. V, I'm a hitman, not a babysitter, all right? I don't Cheech, go- Cheech, I'm giving you an order. Now, what do you do? I know. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Eden. You met Mr. Woofles? <gasps> Hello, Mr. Woofles. Oh, be careful. He's a chihuahua, but there's a pinch of Doberman in him, so sometimes he goes for your throat. Just kidding! No, my oh, darling, do you want some milk or something to eat? I'll grab a saucer. Oh, you don't have to bother with that because I breastfeed him. Just kidding! I sit here, yes? And in some way you're trying to relive it as if it were possible. Ha! It don't say ha. Well, I know it don't say ha. I added that. I don't think you can just add lines. And I think you're an degenerate zombie, so just shut up and breathe. Just shut up. Just shut up! Just shut up! You're lucky you next girl! And you're lucky you're an idiot! Eden, this is Dr. Phillips. Olive Neal, nice to meet ya. Eden Brent. And you are? Yeah, I'm with her. All right, Buster, why don't you park yourself in the back of the theater and try not to snore? I don't like other people watching rehearsals, generally as a rule, because the actors are very sensitive. What'd you say? Yeah, I'm not sensitive. Hey, hey, who are you? I'm the director of the play, and you are? Cheech. Name's Cheech. <gasps> Mr. Cheech. No, not about... Mr. Cheech, simple. Cheech. Cheech. Now you got it. Sorry I'm late, I'm usually punctual. My manicure has had a stroke. How unprofessional. Oh, my poor darling. I'm, I'm... Was that a mutt? Yes, he is. I hate mutts. Oh, she didn't mean that. Okay, let's start the read-through at scene one. Doctor, am I unattractive? 
Worn out? Come, come, Miss Paston. You're being mass... Mass... Masochistic. Masochistic? Yes, masochism is someone who enjoys pain. Enjoys pain? Well, what is she, a moron? David, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, everybody take five. Who is she? I'm sorry about Olive. We need her to raise the money. It's the sad reality of the marketplace, I'll tell you. I can't tell how brilliant you're going to be in this role. Your instincts as an actress are impeccable. You see right through me, don't you? What insight into women. Don't deny it. I mean, I just don't see why she has to be so... frigid. David, I just met your girlfriend. She's a delight. Just thought I'd stop by and see if you needed anything. I'm good, but while we're here, you might as well meet the cast. Olive. June, June. And Ellen. This is Helen. Helen, Ellen. Hope you don't get us confused. Mm-hmm. David, I don't... I just had a few questions concerning some of the dialogue. I just don't think an audience would believe that he'd leave me for that other woman. Uh, excuse me, but I think it's made very clear in the speech about erotic attraction. You fool! He's thinking of me when he does that speech. Don't you know anything? Just the part about the liver spots. Listen, when was the last time you slept next to anything that wasn't your dog? <gasps> Ladies! Edie, can you pull yourself together? Yeah. Okay, all of you start. The heart obeys its own rules. Ha! David, I don't understand the character here. Suddenly she's too odd. Yeah, she shouldn't leave the guy. Then when the lieutenant has that fight with his wife, he should notice her. That way it won't be boring. I think it's a good idea. You're kidding. Personally, I like it. We lose that scene and a lot of good possibilities open yeah, up. That's a hell of a lot better than what you got. I actually like it. You're taking a side? It's not a matter of taking sides. Well, well, I can't make those changes. Well, why not? That rat on a leash brooks one more time. He sounds melancholy. Is he melancholy? I'm done. Don't be so egotistical. Egotistical? Why? Because I'm going to protect my play? Protect it against what? A good idea? Oh, thank you for the support. Oh, Oh, God! Get my rifle! I guess I'm just hypersensitive because maybe deep down I agree with the goon. The play's not working, Helen. It's in my writing. It's not just Olive. Listen, David. Cheech gives great ideas. I think you should give him a shot. Maybe. This is my favorite spot in the park. And in the winter, when it's covered with snow and the lights come on, and you can just see the silhouettes of the Manhattan skyline through the trees, and it's magical. Helen, I think I'm falling in love with you. Don't! I've kept checking my feelings, but there's so much I want to say. No, what are we? Helen! Don't speak! Please! Don't speak! So, what do you guys think of the change to the script? These are brilliant! The whole thing is motivated! You mean I gotta memorize all new lines? How did you come up with such divine changes? Well, they're not really mine. Oh no, whose are they? God's? <laughs> Let's go celebrate. Drinks on my husband. You missed the idea. What? Here, come here, let me show you. You rewrote it? Yeah. They taught me how to write in school before I burned it down. Look, I know how people talk, all right? You ever think about doing anything else? Like what? Like writing. You have a huge Listen gift. Listen to me. Your play was very good. You just didn't use your head. So Olive actually told me you took out a few guys. Is that true? Yeah, I took care of a few guys. How does it feel when you actually kill a man? Feels okay. Even the first time? First time? First time was a punk in prison. He squealed on me and I stuck an ice pick in his back. An ice pick? An ice pick, yeah. I did it over and over 40 times! Forget about it. It was a mess. Even better than I was the last time, baby. Ooh, I'm good. Hey, David, how was I? Wonderful. You finished your whole speech this time. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Oh, a hundred orchids. Oh, they're beautiful. Gee, but Mr. Woofle said it was a hoot. Olive was good. She still needs some work, but... It's her. That's what it is. It's Olive. I can't have her ruin in my show. Your show? My, our show. I put a lot into this. I can't fire her. You know this. Don't yell at me. You're being very temperamental. Olive, you were swell in the show tonight. Oh, well, thank you. What a marvelous audience. Excuse me, Mr. Valenti. Darling, could you give me that cue a little quicker in act two? You know, the one where your character is quoting Hamlet? Oh, well, you know it's hard because I always forget the second part. <laughs> I know it's... Or not to be. Okay? To be! Or not to be. Yep, that's the way it goes. I can't tell you how many times I've seen it. A show trying to find its own life, and then, somewhere along the lines, a work of art is born. Here's to your future. Cheers. Helen, when Ellen gets home, I'm gonna tell her about this. <coughs> oh, David! No, I've decided. I'm in love with you, Helen, and it's time for me to act on it. Oh, everything is moving so fast! Oh, David, it's so fast! Helen, I love Don't you! Speak. Please! Don't speak! Imagine that director telling me I'm overacting in the first scene. And you know what I'm doing, Cheech? Is I'm working on a superior laugh. Like, ha ha ha! He he he! And he says no! Well, Cheech, what are we doing yeah, here? Yeah, we gotta go pick up Nick. 
She's great in the show, huh? Oh, the best. She'll take Broadway by storm. Well, I don't understand. I thought we had to go pick up Nick. Yeah, Nick's got a surprise for you. I don't you. understand why Nick would have a surprise for me at the dock. She's got a moonlight cruise. Well, listen, when she gets here, tell her you're going to give us a new line. So you don't like we discussed. Look, Nick, you don't fiddle with the winning show. No, the script's basically frozen. Just walk over there. Huh? Go on. He's over there. Nicky? Let's avoid confusion. Sure. She'll get some new lines, or I'll nail your kneecaps in the dance floor. Hey, Olive! I think you should know this. You're a horrible actress! Like, God, I don't have to hear that voice anymore. I don't believe this. If Olive, if Olive doesn't show in time, I'm putting the understudy on. Well, who knows, maybe she got stage fright. Not Olive. That dame doesn't have a nerve in her body. I don't think her spinal cord touches her brain. And where's Cheech? He'd know where she is. David, did you hear about Olive? Oh, what now? They, they killed her. What? Out in the docks, a gangland hit. David, I need to talk to you. How could you? How could there you? There was no way to fire her. I'm an artist, too. Not great like you, but first, I'm a human being. A decent, moral human what being. What are you doing with Helen Sinclair, then? What's that got to do with this? <laughs> you know? Before you start scolding me about how to live my life, maybe you should take a step back. Look at your own. Cheech. Oh, Mr. V, what are you doing here? Olive would have been a star, don't you think? It's all right. We'll take care of those Custabet guys. You know, Marty Bannister said he saw you pick up Olive tonight. She got it, Cheech. Didn't you tell me you didn't see her? Me? Yeah, I said I did. I, I picked her up and I dropped her off a few blocks from the theater. Why? There was no preview that night. No rehearsal. Really? How come you left her alone, Cheech? I'm gonna level with you, all right? I had a crap game, I didn't want to miss it. Cheech! Her. Listen! I'm gonna find out who hit her, all right? So on Sunday, we're gonna have dinner with Rebecca. We're gonna go downtown. I've fallen in love with Helen Sinclair. I want you to know that I didn't mean for this to happen. It just did. I'm not surprised. She is extraordinary. Well, so are you. It's me that's all screwed up. David, I just want to know. What did I do wrong? Oh, Ellen, it's not- Why, after everything I've put up with? Every complaint, every mishap, all of it! What the hell did I do to deserve this? Ellen, I- I've tried, David. I know. I've tried so hard. I know. I'll be gone in the morning. Ellen, please! Oh, David, they loved it! They absolutely loved it! Oh, darling, you look pale. Not to worry, so this time I belong to you. You were terrific tonight. They're your words. I'm just a vessel. You fill me. It was great, huh? What do you want? I have a couple notes if you, you want me to- You killed Olive, Cheech. For that, I can never forgive you. Hey, Cheech! You're done. Cheech! Oh my god! I'm sorry, Cheech! <clears throat> What are you sorry for? David, you gotta learn to be happy with the life you've created for yourself. You got a good thing going with Ellen. Don't throw it away for some Hollywood ditz. Why would she ever take me back? <laughs> David, you love her. She loves you. She'll take you back. Cheech! No, I... don't speak. Don't speak. So I can stay with you for the next couple of days? Thank you. Ellen! I was just Ellen, to... please! Congratulations on your head, David. I always knew you had it in you. Ellen, I'm finished with it. Living in the garrets and eating cheese and drinking wine. It's not important. You are. I love you. You were right. Let's go back to Pittsburgh, have kids, get married. What happened to being an artist? There's two things of which I'm certain. One is that I love you. Two is that I'm not an artist. So you're just going to drop everything? Abandon your play? For you, it's worth it. Will you marry me? Good morning, Huckleberry. Did you sleep well? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I think you did. You snored a lot. <laughs> oh, coffee? 
Hey parents, I don't need a ride. I'm taking the bus. Did you feed the dog? That dog's a fat hunk of crap. I'm out. That's Kenny, our son. Um, I'm not really sure what's going on exactly. Navigating through family ties can be difficult, but having psychogenic amnesia while doing it all makes it almost impossible. See how Claire finds herself by discovering her domestically abusive past in Buddy Mirrors by David Lindsay Abire. Oh, I'm sorry, honey, it's like this. You see, I'm Richard Fiffle, and I'm your husband. You have psychogenic amnesia. Two years ago, you woke up one day, and your memory was completely gone. Ever since then, as soon as you go to sleep at night, well, you forget everything, and the next morning, we gotta start all over again. So what you're saying is, every morning we have the same conversation? Yes, well, um, I change a few words here and there. Oh, check this out. I made this book for you. It's supposed to get you through the day. You see, there is a layout of the house and some descriptions of people that you may meet. Thank you. This is so nice of you, Philip. Richard. Richard, right. Sorry. Now, if my memory serves me correctly, isn't amnesia usually brought on by some sort of trauma? Uh, well, I... I mean, I... I'm gonna go take a shower. Uh, the fridge is full. Help yourself. Uh, okay. Love you, honey. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait, Richard, what's my name? Good morning, Claire. Claire, my name's Claire. Take a deep breath and greet the morning. <sighs> Hello, morning. Hello, Claire. Oh, my. Shh, shh. It's Zach, your brother. I'm, I'm here to rescue you. That man, Richard, is going to kill you. But he seems so nice. Please, let's go. Sorry, I, I haven't gone to this part yet. It doesn't say anything about a limping man with a lisp. Claire, forget the book. If you ever loved me, you get in this car now. Okay, okay. Where are we going anyways? To the country. Your mother's house. Our mother's house. Well, she was my mother too. Even if she testified against me. Even if she said I was dead to her. Well, she's dead now! <laughs> you seem like quite the family. <laughs> oh, look. Here it says her name was Gertie. Give me that. Richard made all that up. You have me now. I'll tell you everything you need to know. Okay, how did I lose my memory? Except that! My physical infirmities and your memory problem are two things that I cannot talk about! Okay, why are you taking me away like this? Okay, there are three things that I cannot talk about! And why is that handcuff on your wrist? Okay, there are many things that I cannot talk about right now! We're here. Pretty house. I can tell that I grew up here. Claire, this is my, um, friend, Millet. Hi! Nice to meet you! Millet, did you get everything on the list? Yeah, they're all in the trunk of my car, boss. Uh, um, did you guys steal all those cars? Yeah! Millet! Oh, I mean we them. <laughs> you guys stay put. I'm gonna go check out the car, okay? Hey. Hey, Millet. Does, does Zach ever say why I'm such a blank slate? Um, I'm not really allowed to talk about it. Oh, okay, your husband threw you across the kitchen floor and smashed your head with an oven door. Ah, oh, Millet! What? So is that why Zach took me away from that Richard guy? Because he hurt me? Everyone playing by the rules in here. Why didn't you tell me that Richard beat me up? Millet, sorry! I panic, it's a... Uh... Claire, I need you to know that you're safe here, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> Pictures. Okay, so this must be mom and dad. Claire, what you got there? Nothing, just looking at some pic. Cheers. Hey, this is Zach's obituary. That's, that's not real, Claire! It says Zach was eight years old when he died. That's a different boy, Claire! Claire! Richard, 
How did you find me here? Claire, did this man hurt you? Mom, me and Richard are here to take you home. Will someone please just tell me what's going on exactly? Zach? Mom, this man isn't Zach. His name is Philip. He's my biological father, and you were married to him for 19 years, Mom. Don't you remember that? I thought Richard was my husband. Second husband. Claire, I was, I was waiting for the right time to tell you. I'm, I'm really sorry, okay? Sorry for what? Mom, Philip has a short fuse and a killer left hook. Claire, I, I used to have a temper, but, but not anymore, okay? I, I've changed. Richard didn't beat me up. It was you all along. Mom, do you remember my 12th birthday? I don't know what happened, but, but he got so angry that he, he grabbed you and he threw you across the kitchen floor and, and he smashed your head with an oven door. And, and you fainted and when you woke up, everything was gone. You didn't even know who I was, Mom. You done, kid! Claire, I brought you here so, so I could apologize. I have changed. We can just start over. Get off of me, Philip. I'm not going anywhere with you. Richard, I just want to go home. I'm so tired. What a day. <laughs> Richard, the book, it, it needs to be updated. The doctors didn't want you to get that upset every day. I'm telling you to put it in. The first sentence, your first husband beat you hard and often. Hey, Mom. Yeah, honey? Don't go to sleep. I, I just want a couple more minutes with you. I'm sorry, honey. I'm fading. Claire? Claire, what's my name? Richard. Richard, right. Good. Do, do you think tomorrow might be any different? I don't know, Philip. I've been playing tennis for the last 10 years, and oftentimes I realize that I play better when playing tougher opponents than easier opponents who I know I'm going to beat. Oftentimes, this is a strategy that I implement, and I don't necessarily tell myself who I'm going to be playing and this has led to my success in competitive tournaments. This relates to today's quote by James Thurber, that it is better to know some of the questions than all the answers. From this quote, we can extract a deeper meaning, that oftentimes it's better if we don't know everything that's coming in the future, but rather still have questions. Then only can we strive to improve ourselves and be successful. Today, we will look at this meaning through three main aspects. First, We'll look at the award-winning movie, The Martian, and how Mark Watney was able to survive by not knowing what was coming in his future. Next, we'll look at the realm of sports, in particular, Jackie Robinson, and how he was able to reform our society. And lastly, by looking at Franklin D. Roosevelt and his presidency, we will look at how oftentimes not knowing all the answers can be the best approach. But first off, let's start off by talking about the movie, The Martian, in which astronaut Mark Watney is stranded on Mars by his fellow astronauts during a storm. At this instant, Mark Watney pushed himself to survive because he had no way of predicting that he would be in this situation. He realized that he, although he had many questions about whether he would survive or not, it was important that he made an effort and thus he was motivated to try new things. Had Mark Watney knew that this was going to happen, it is likely that he wouldn't have prepared himself nearly as much, and he wouldn't have been able to make the reforms that he made in the scientific industry, such as finding a way to grow potatoes on Mars, and establishing a communication line back to Earth. Next, we could talk about Jackie Robinson, 
someone we all know as the first ever African American baseball player. Now, Jackie Robinson was hated by almost every single person in the sports world at the time that he became employed because people didn't like the changes that were occurring and they believed that baseball was a white man's sport. But Jackie Robinson's not knowing that he was going to be in this position pushed him to prove himself on the field. Had he knew that over time things would change and that he would be accepted, he likely wouldn't have tolerated the abuse that he took and he wouldn't have pushed himself to the extent which he did. At the end of the day, Jackie Robinson didn't fight back with violence or by quitting, but rather he simply stuck to his game and did what he could by playing better. And this helped him in the long run, since he was able to answer questions that he had, not by knowing the answers, but rather by motivating himself. Finally, we can look at how this idea can not only be seen through pop culture and through sports, but it's also been, been an integral part of our nation's history. Franklin D. Roosevelt is someone we all know as the guy who picked our nation out of the Great Depression. He reformed our society and helped us survive future disasters like the 2008 stock market crash. But what many don't know is that FDR's success was in a large part because he didn't know what was going to happen when he entered his presidency. He was able to acknowledge the fact that he had problems and that he didn't have a full laid out plan with answers, but that if he continued to reform as he went, he could be most successful. Thus, he was able to create all kinds of programs that helped employ thousands of people in America and provided jobs for those who didn't necessarily have a living and a way of supporting their families. He was able to increase people's standard income and standard way of living, and this eventually reformed our society to the point where today people can live in prosperous businesses and live happy lives. FDR's success pertains perfectly to this quote by James Thurber because he didn't know all the answers, but the fact that he had many questions motivated him to keep pushing himself and to keep introducing new reforms. He also was much more open to taking input from other people around him in his cabinet. And this was all because he didn't necessarily know whether his plans would work or not. So today, we were able to look at this quote by James Thurber, that it's better to know some of the questions than all the answers, and understood that oftentimes, it's better if we don't know what's coming in the future, because it will motivate us to keep thinking on our feet and to keep trying new things. Then only can we strive for success. This is something that I implement in my daily life as I play tennis, and it's a major reason why I don't tell myself who I'm playing in tournaments. Ain't no rest for the wicked. Money don't grow on trees. I got bills to pay, I got mouths to feed, and ain't nothing in this world for free. I can't slow down, I can't hold back. Don't you know, I wish I could. Ain't no rest for the wicked. Till we close our eyes. For good. The Royal Tenenbaums. Screenplay by Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson. Royal Tenenbaum had three children, Chaz, Richie, and Margot. Their family was wildly successful in all that they did. Richie Tenenbaum had been a champion tennis player since the third grade. He turned pro at 17 and won U.S. Nationals three years in a row. Good game, Richie. You know, you always were my favorite. I know, Dad. Chaz Tenenbaum had, since elementary school, bought real estate and seemed to have an almost preternatural understanding of international finance. Dad, I need $187. What for? Well, I was going to- Wait a minute. I just remembered. I don't care. Ask your mother. Mom? Go write yourself a check, honey. What? Margot was the only one of the Tenenbaum children who was adopted. Her father always made sure he noted this when introducing her. This is my adopted daughter, Margot Tenenbaum. It's a pleasure to meet you. Whatever. Margot was a gifted playwright and won a Braverman grant of $50,000 in the ninth grade. Well, what'd you think of Margot's play? Uh, it wasn't very believable. I mean, it was just a bunch of kids dressed up in costumes. Good night, everyone. Well, at least the costumes were cheap. How dare you speak to our daughter like that? Sweetie, don't be mad. That's just a one man's opinion. Richie's best friend, Eli Cash, lived across the street. He was a failing writer and regular fixture at family gatherings. Who are you? Eli? Eli, Richie's friend? Oh, right. What is he doing here? He's 
spending the night. You know, you really should start taking more interest in our children's lives. Ethelene Tenenbaum kept the house and raised the children, and their well-being was her highest priority. Royal and Ethelene Tenenbaum had three children, and then they separated. They were never legally divorced. Are you getting a divorce? At the moment, no. Uh, but it doesn't look good. Do you still love us? Uh, of course I do. Do you still love Mom? Very much. But she asked me to leave and told me I had to uh, respect her position on the matter. Was it our fault? Yes. Well, no. I mean, obviously, having you guys around didn't necessarily help the matter. Uh, but no, Lord, no. Uh, then why'd she ask you to leave? <laughs> I don't really know anymore. Your mother never really was the most reasonable woman. However, 20 years after their parents' separation, none of the Tenenbaum children had spoken to Royal. Chaz's wife, Rachel, was killed in a plane crash the previous summer. Since then, he'd become increasingly concerned with his child, Ari's safety. Ari, smoke detectors. Check. Home security system. Check. Sprinklers. Check. Backup sprinklers. Dad, I don't think we have those. What? We have to get out of here. The house can burn down at any minute. Ari, pack your bags. We're going to your grandmother's. With Chaz, Margo, and Richie all grown up and out of the house, Ethleen had found comfort in their family tax consultant, Henry Sherman. I think it'd probably be advantageous for your marriage status to be legally established as single. What do you mean, Henry? I mean, for tax purposes. But I thought it was Ethleen, yes? I love you. Did you already know that? I no, Henry, I didn't. Will you marry me? Chess, what's going on? Ari, get the bags. Sorry, Dad. Sorry about Ari. Oh, we got locked out Ethel. of our apartment. Okay, so did you pack your bags before Ethel you got we locked out? We can't stay there anymore. What are you talking about? The apartment. I need new sprinklers and a backup security system installed. Okay, Ethel. but there are no sprinklers here either. Oh, well, we might need to do something about that too. Uh, so, Ethelene, will you marry me? Not now, Henry. Bum 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 bum. Bum, bum, bum. Can we have dinner with your mother sometime? What for, Eli? Well, we've been dating for three years now, and I think at least your mother should know about us. I have to go now. Margo? <coughs> Open a window in here. How do you stand all this smoke? It doesn't bother me. Well, I don't think that's very healthy, do you? Chess came home. Why? Well, I don't know exactly, but I think he's been very depressed. I am too. Well, then you should come home. Okay, I will. You got a minute? What are you doing here? I need a favor. Mm. I want to spend some time with you and the children. Are you crazy? Now hold on, dang it. Uh, look, baby, I, I, I'm dying. I'm six to dog. I'll be dead in six weeks. Oh my god, what are you talking about? I'm sorry, I didn't know- Wait a second, listen. I'm not really dying. I just want to spend some time with you. A month, maybe What's two. What's wrong with you? Ethel! Go away! Oh, baby, I, I am dying. Are you or aren't you? Dying? Um... Yeah. Hey, Eli. Look, I know this is weird, but I had to tell someone. I'm coming home soon, and Margot's gonna be there, and I don't know what I'm gonna do, because I think, I think I'm in love with her. Who's your father? His name is Royal Tenenbaum. But you told me he was already dead. Well, he's dying now. Hey, Margot. Gee, it's been a while, but you look great. You don't look so bad yourself. Hello, everyone. Ari, go to your room. Uh, Royal, this is Henry Sherman. How do you do? Ah, uh, well, what can I say? I'm dying. You don't look too bad to me, Pop. Oh, well, thank you. What have you got? I've got a pretty bad case of, uh, cancer, I'm afraid. So, how long are you gonna last? A month? A year? A day? About six weeks, but uh, let me get to the point here. The three of you and your mother are all I've got, and I love you more than anything. I want to set things right. Will you give me the chance? No! What do you propose to do? Well, uh, make up for lost time, I suppose. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to take you all to see your grandmother. I haven't been out there since I was six. I haven't been out there at all. I was never invited. Well, she's not your real grandmother, so I don't know why you'd be interested. Uh, but anyways, you're invited this time. You know, Rachel's buried there too. Who? My wife. Well, we'll just have to swing by her grave too. Anybody want to grab a few burgers and hit the cemetery? Unbelievable. Chaz? Well, wait a second. Uh, Chaz, come back. Will you at least let me see my grandchild? Stay away from my child. Do you understand me? Do you think you could start forgiving me? No, why should because I? Because you're hurting Are me. Are you even listening to me? Yes, I am. And I think you're having a nervous breakdown. I don't believe you've recovered from Rachel's I can't death. deal with this anymore. Oh. Hey there, Ari. I didn't see you there. I'm Royal. You heard of me? Yeah. Look, I'm sorry for your loss. Your mother was a terribly attractive woman. Thank you? So how's your father doing? He's fine. You should tell him you want to meet me. But we just met. No, we didn't. Look, Ari, 
I want us to have a relationship, but uh, we're going to have to pull some strings if we want to make that happen. Here's what you have to tell him. Here's what you have to tell him. I bet Mom would have wanted me to meet him before he died. She would have, wouldn't she? You want to meet him? Let's go. Hey, you seem pretty down lately. Is everything okay? I'm fine. Well, if you need someone to talk to, let me know. I know you're having some problems, but anyway, maybe I can help. Thanks. By the way, I heard about what you said to Eli about how you're in love with me. He told you? I think I should go. Did you tell Margot what I said to you? Why, she say something? Did you tell her? Yeah, I did. I found it odd that you said you're in love with your sister. She's adopted. Well, I'm in love with her too. You are? Of course I am. But she's never going to feel the same way because she's in love with you. Mom, I think Royal's very lonely. Have you tried talking to him about this? Briefly, and he agreed- I'm sorry, maybe I'm a little confused. What exactly are you suggesting? That he come here and stay in my room. Are you out of your mind? No, I think he'd be much more comfortable here Who gives a crap? I do. Oh, you poor sucker. You poor washed up little papa's boy. All right, let's not get out of hand. Don't get in the middle of this, Mr. Sherman, please. Call me dad. This is a family matter. Don't talk to him like that. Well, if Royal's sleeping in your room, where are you going to sleep, Richie? I'll just camp out upstairs. We brought an extra sleeping bag. You can use our... Ari! I don't mind, Dad. I like him. But it's not your decision. Nor is it yours. Well, he's already up there. He is? He is? He is? I am. I think he's asleep because of the meds he's on. But I guess you could wake him up and throw him out if Mom says it's okay. I don't care. You know, he's your dad too, Chaz. No, he isn't. Get out. Oh. Okay, uh... Let me just collect my things, then. Ow! Are you okay? Mom! Oh, my goodness! Oh, Ethling, thank God you're here. Uh, Chaz, Richie, could you leave us alone, please? Ethling, uh, here's my will. Uh, could you proofread it for me? Okay. How are you feeling? Well, uh, much better with all of you here. Scrapping and yelling, mixing it up. I'm loving every minute with this damn crew. I want to thank you, by the way, for raising our children. Okay. I'm serious. You always put them first, didn't you? Well, I tried to, but lately it seems like maybe I didn't do such a great job. Don't do that to yourself. I I'm one who failed them, not you. Besides, and Why didn't you give a damn about us, Royal? Why didn't you care? I don't know. But I'm ashamed of myself. I'll tell you one thing, though. You've got more grit, fire, and guts than any uh, bobtailed badger I've ever seen. And <laughs> What's so funny? Nothing. No, tell me. Nothing, just these little expressions of yours. I don't know what that means, but I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> uh, Ethelene, have you thought about my proposal? Uh, not now, Henry. Can I ask you something, Henry? Sure. Are you trying to steal my woman? I beg your pardon? You heard me. Listen, Royal, if you think oh, that you I'm trying to- Oh, you want to talk some jive? I'll talk some jive like you never heard! Oh, yeah. Right on! Sit down. What'd you say? Oh, no. What'd you say? I said sit down. Oh, yeah? Well, I want you out of my house. This isn't even your house. And you don't have cancer either. With a credit score as low as yours, every hospital in this state would reject you. How'd you know? Trust me. I know rejection. But why would he lie to us? Yes, can I get a taxi for 111 Archer Avenue? Of course, immediately. No, I don't want it in five minutes. I want it now. I can't lie anymore. It's time to come clean. How'd you get all that medical equipment? Oh, I took some money out of Ari's college fund. Uh, but I do have high blood pressure, though. Look, I just want to say that the last six days have been the best of my entire Why'd life. Why'd you do this to us, Royal? What was the point? I thought maybe I could win you back. But we hadn't spoken in seven years. Plus, I was broke, and I got kicked out of my hotel. You're a bastard. Hi, Royal. He's not your father, Margo. Neither are you. Don't do this to your kid, Chess. I, I don't want this to happen to you. Don't worry. It won't. You know, Richie, uh, this closeness of death has been very profound on me. I feel like a different person. I really do. Dad, you were never dying. But I'm gonna live! What are you doing? Just playing some records. I'm not in love with you anymore. I didn't know you ever were. Let's not make this any more difficult than it already is. Okay. Okay what? Okay, I'm not in love with you either. I know, you're in love with Richie. Ever since he came back, you haven't given me the time of day. You know what, I think you should leave. Hey, I heard yelling. Is Eli okay? Yeah, I think it's over with him. 
We mostly just talked about you anyways. You did? Yeah, it was part of the attraction, if you know what I mean. I have to tell you something. What's that? I'm in love with you. I love you too, but I think we're just gonna have to be secretly in love with each other and leave it at that, Richie. Lean on me when you're not strong. I'll be your friend. Thanks again for letting me see my grandchild. I uh, really appreciate it. Already I can tell you're going to be a much better father than I ever was. Well, Dad, you didn't give me very big shoes to fill. Hey, is that that BB in your hand I see? Do you remember when oh, we- Yeah, Dad, I remember when you shot me. That was the object of the game, wasn't it? But we were on the same team. The way I see it, there are no teams. I'll help you carry on. So, have you written any plays recently? I don't want to talk about it with you. Uh, can't a guy be a jerk his whole life and want to repair the damage? Dad, I bet you don't even know my middle name. That's a trick question. You don't have one. Helen. Oh, that's my mother's name. I know. Well, in any case, if you ever do decide to write again, I'd love to read it. Do you really mean that? Of course I do. I love my adopted daughter just as much as I love my real children. I thought you left. Oh, Ethelene, uh, I've got something for you. What's this? A divorce. From you? Yes, if you'll just sign here, please. You know, Ethelene, I've always been considered the uh, bad guy. I don't think you're a bad guy, Royal. I just think you're a big old ball of butternut squash. Are divorced yet? Almost. I just had to file the paperwork. Ethelene, I'm sorry I let you down over the years. I've been trying to make it up to you. Well, anyways, here comes my taxi. I love you, Ethelene. I didn't think much of Henry at first, but now I get it. He's everything I'm not. Sorry! <laughs> Ari! Are you okay? I'm okay, Dad. Royal saved me. What just happened? A taxi crashed into the front of the house. Oh my goodness, is everyone okay? I don't know. In his will, Royal stipulated that his funeral take place at dusk. Everyone in their family attended, and they agreed that Royal would have found the event to be most satisfactory. I can't believe he's really gone. You know, well, he's wanted to be a tenant bomb. You always have been. So, uh, Ethelene, now that Royal's gone, will you marry me? I'm not now, Henry. I'll think about it. We've had a rough year, Ari. I know we have, Dad. Uh, you know, this is how Royal would have wanted it. Us, as a family, together. I hope you find your peace Falling on your knees Change Logan, honey, yeah, I've got a surprise for you. You see, my mom, she's an adventurer, so there's always some sort of surprise in her lap. Logan, honey, this is the biggest surprise yet. You've been asking for this since you were little. But mom, the only thing I ever wanted was a little brother. A oh, brother? You adopted a brother for me? I just ran! Don't wait for the garage! Boop! Boop, 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 boop! Uh, uh, Mama, that's not a baby. Whatever. Hi, I'm Logan. What's your name? The kid didn't answer. He didn't even move. Oh, just give him a few minutes, honey. Java's still charging. What? Charging? You built me a robot brother? Oh, of course not a robot brother, honey. I built you a robot cousin. Well, well, can he play soccer and do magic tricks? Could he be my assistant? Well, sure, he can basically do anything a kid can do, even homework. Also, I've arranged for him to be in your class at school. Mom, you want me to bring a robot to school? Well, sure, he'll go to school every day, but you can't tell anybody he's a robot, honey. Suddenly, Java began to speak. <laughs> Good morning. When I first got my baby brother, I was so excited. Until I met him. He was loud, ate food through his nostrils, and he always hogged the ladies. But as time went on, I learned to adapt to his annoying behavior. And well now, I'm able to tolerate him.
In this story, we see Logan go through similar struggles while trying to adapt to his new family member. Will he learn to love and accept Java, or will Java forever be the annoying little sibling? In Science No Fair by Nancy Krulik and Amanda Brozier. You see, Logan, honey, Java has a computer for a brain, so it can help you with some of those tough math problems and even your chores. <sniffs> Logan, it's a pigsty in here. G -g I do not see the animals anywhere. Mom, is he for real? Almost. Almost was not good enough for me. I was not going to go to school with a robot. So I came up with an idea. <coughs> Mom, I think I caught a bug. Can I just please stay home? I can do it. I caught a bug too. Boys, you better hurry up. The bus will be here any minute now. Can you please act normal today? I am programmed to act normal. At the bus stop, my best friend Stanley waits me. I introduce him to Java, but that's when he points it out. Nadine. Hey, Logan. Who's your friends? <clears throat> Sorry, <coughs> that's my cousin. His name's Java. Cool name. The bus pulled up. Me and Java sat down, but Nadine kept asking Java weird questions. So I had to change the subject. Uh, Nadine, uh, uh, what, what are you doing for the science fair? What is science fair? Oh, the science fair? It's a super duper huge deal. Everybody brings in the science project, and well, <laughs> the best project was a prize. Have you ever won prize, Logan? Suddenly, I hear laughter coming up from the seat in front of me. Up pop the Silver Spoon Twins wearing their usual matching sweaters. Logan's never won anything. Yeah. Because we always win. Well, me and Stanley work together this year, and we have something amazing. <laughs> Is it going to be a bigger disaster than your magic trick last year? <laughs> Ew. No, this will be different. Our invention is going to... It's going to knock it out of the park. That is baseball term. Is science fair in baseball stadium? The twins gave Java a weird look, and then turned back into their seats. But near the end of the bus ride, I heard them whispering, Sherry. There's something weird about that new kit. Yeah, and we're gonna find out what it is. After class that day, I see the twins running up to Java. <laughs> hey Java, you should be in our group for the science fair. So that was their plan. They're gonna use my super smart cousin for their project. But it wasn't fair, Java's my android. On the day of the science fair, Nadine was setting up her project right next to the supersonic spun machine. Ah, we love you. That means Stanley made, or otherwise known as our potato battery. Next to us was the twins in Java, who made a real beehive with actual bees for their project. And then I see Nadine walk over and pull Java by the arm. Hey Java, you should try out my magnet projects. <laughs> Nadine didn't ask me to try out her project. K-O! Don't you mean okay? The average person spends three years sitting in the toilet. What are you talking about? The world's stinky she's come from France. Every spiders make milk. The one is totally ease. Suddenly, smoke blasted out of Java's ears. Something was really wrong. Mom, help him. The kid's gonna explode. Well, honey, there's a lot of metal inside Java. And Nadine's magnet must be... Well, I'm mostly moving it around. I need to get him into a quiet room so I can rewire him fast. I ran over to get him, but he was too strong. He yanked him so free and started spinning on his head. So I tried to grab the magnet and pull Java into the room. But at the same time, Nadine was heading Java her magnet and got pulled with two hands too. It turned into some sort of tug of war battle. And then Java tripped and fell into the twins' beehive. Uh-oh. And then bees began flying everywhere. And then Principal Kumquat was running and knocked over a volcano. So all the ooey gooey lava erupted, squirting all over the floors. Everybody was slipping while we were running to the exits. It was the strangest science fair ever. The judges didn't even give prizes to the best projects. At least the twins didn't win. Just then, <laughs> Java, you ruined our project. Yeah, 
and the whole science fair. Freak, hey, who are you calling a freak? You and your weirdo cousin Java. You can't talk that way to my, to my family. I stopped. I just couldn't believe I was calling a bucket of bolts my family. But, but that's what it felt like. And then Nadine walked up. Chava, oh my gosh, you were hilarious yesterday. Where'd you get those weird facts? They're in my hard drive. Oh, whoa, whoa. that's my cousin, full of weird facts. Yeah. Oh, Chava, you were so brave yesterday with all those bees like you didn't even cry when everybody else did. It's almost like you're, I don't know, part machine. After class that day, I realized that with Java here, something still didn't change. Stanley was still my best friend. The twins were still bullies, and luckily, nobody knew Java was a robot. For now, anyways. When you hear about yard signs, you probably think of garage sales, graduation parties, or homes for sale. But my first thought is campaign signs. The election of 2016 is still fresh on my mind when all my neighbors' yard signs were up for their candidates. Driving through my subdivision, I couldn't help but match my neighbors' faces to their signs. Unconsciously, I changed the way I viewed them, just from discovering which political party they endorsed. Bill was no longer the happy and caring old man who was eager to share valuable life lessons, and Miss Klein was no longer the horrible mean lady who blew her leaves into our yard. I actually liked her now after finding out that she supports the same political party as I do. And I am certainly not alone. Yale University political scientist David Brooks argues that people are being measured by a party label, determining whether they should be hired, married, trusted, or discriminated against. Political preferences are now symbols of someone's worth and dignity. Sadly, our country has become the divided states of America, and that needs to change. So today, we'll look at the problems of political polarization, highlight the causes of this extreme division, and finally, explore some solutions that we can all use to unite our states of America. The Pew Research Center defines political polarization as the growing gap between liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, and this gap is growing wider each day. In 1960, when Americans were asked whether they'd be angry if their children married across party lines, only 5% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats said they'd be upset. Fifty years later, the market research company YouGov conducted the same poll and found that an astounding 49% of Republicans and 33% of Democrats expressed concern about cross-party marriage. These marriage polls uncover a deeper problem. American politics has become increasingly divisive, and political conversations have become more awkward and unpleasant than trying to explain the Tide Pod challenge to your grandparents. Your generation ate paste, mine guzzles detergent. We'll never agree on which idea is better, just like Congress. Consider this, when was the last time you turned on the news and heard the Senate reached a compromise? And have you noticed that recently? You seem to have lost a few friends on social media. Do you, like me, suddenly have anxiety about dinner at your grandparents because you disagree on a few political issues? It is now the norm to see a constant divide between those who are red and those who are blue. And this division runs deep. Peter Ditto, a social psychologist at UC Irvine explains, Red Sox fans hate Yankees fans, but there's nothing more to it than that. Once the subject changes, all that goes away. But in politics, people see it as an ethical difference. In other words, those who are not members of the correct party are deemed to lack compassion, morality, or even loyalty to our country. Harvard Law professor Cass Sunstein suggests that partyism reinforces our desire to reject the ideas of our political opponents. The outcome? Achieving meaningful change has been virtually impossible on key issues like gun control, 
immigration, health care, abortion, and climate change. The proposed legislation is often too extreme for any chance of compromise. The result is generally a stalemate. Any real change is postponed or ultimately abandoned. But let's set aside all the harms of partyism for a moment and consider the reasons for this political division in America. Popular explanations for polarization include our two-party system, the urban and rural divide, religious differences, and income inequality. But these factors have become embedded in our society and are not going to change anytime soon. So I am going to focus on the causes that we can fix, which include corporate control of politics and our preference for similar opinions. In 2010, a landmark Supreme Court decision known as Citizens United gave corporations and unions the green light to spend money on federal elections. And in 2014, in McCutcheon v. Federal Election Commission, the court extended its ruling, holding that the government could not limit the amount of money individuals give to candidates and parties. Essentially, these two laws ushered in the era of unlimited political donations from corporations, unions, and individuals. According to the American news website Vox, less than 1% of the population gives 68% of the money to politicians, and 74% of those donors are extremely polarized. We, the remaining 99% of the American people, are simply powerless because we don't have the money to compete. But what has truly been the flames of our country's division is the media. Stanford University found that over 75% of Americans believe that news organizations are biased when presenting political issues. A generation ago, it wouldn't have mattered which television channel you watched. News was just news. Today, it has been said that if you watch Fox News, you're living on a different planet than if you watch MSNBC. Now we can choose to hear messages that reinforce our beliefs and avoid those of different points of view, which is a phenomenon known as the confirmation bias. And the internet has been programmed to exploit this phenomenon. According to a 2017 study from Brown University, search engines like Google have been programmed to dissect what type of information we like to read and pump us with information that reinforces our political viewpoints. We have been feeding ourselves only one-sided information. And this has led to tunnel vision and blindness to the experiences and thoughts of our fellow Americans. Politics is essentially a reflection of our beliefs and its polarization will not change unless we change first. We must ultimately hold ourselves accountable for America's political division. But can we fix the problem? Can we lessen the effects of big money? Can we find a way to bridge the political divide in our media? The answer is yes. It's true that without a constitutional amendment, we can't stop the wealthy or big corporations from making donations, but we can limit their influence with actions at the state and local levels. A 2016 article in the Atlantic Monthly points to several real life examples. New York City matches small donations six to one for those candidates who agree to contribution limits. And Maine offers grants to candidates who receive a specific number of $5 donations from individuals. These programs amplify the contributions of ordinary citizens and encourage politicians to pay attention to all of their donors, not just the corporate and wealthy ones. As for our own news consumption, while we may not be able to change social media in the way it feeds off our confirmation bias, we can seek out more impartial news sources. I'm not saying stop watching Fox News or MSNBC, but add to these sources with websites like All Sides, which can help us get a more balanced view of everyday conflicts. Don't trust the internet? Try talk radio, specifically the podcast Pantsuit Politics, where two hosts, one Democrat and one Republican discuss daily news in a remarkably peaceful manner. But ultimately, the power to create social change is in our hands. We must step out of our personal bubbles and step into forums of meaningful and empathetic discussion. And to achieve this, we need to exercise the power of listening. Stephen Covey, author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, captured it best. Seek first to understand then to be understood. We cannot judge others without first understanding their stories. 
Listening to the other side will open our eyes to factors we would have never previously considered. When we grasp the root of where our opponents are coming from, we will have more productive conversations. And if we, the people, demand respectful communication from ourselves and support fact-based news, then the media will have no choice but to steer away from bias. As Abraham Lincoln once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. America cannot move forward as a divided nation. It's about time we realize that our similarities far exceed our differences. So the next time we see a campaign sign that we disagree with, let's try to ignore the label and offer our neighbor a genuine smile in an open ear for friendly conversation. Because we are all Americans. And that is, after all, what matters in the end. Thank you. After a long day of school, work, and practice, the warm embrace of my comforter is my absolute favorite hello. But my next morning's hardest goodbye. If you're anything like me, the sound that we loathe the most is the sound of our morning alarm. But it's not just the initial shock of an alarm that affects our sleep hygiene. So do early classes, a hectic work schedule, and especially a 5 a.m. wake-up call for a friend's ex tournament. Let's face it, who doesn't want a better night's sleep? Why don't we say good night to restless nights and rude wake-up calls with the S Plus by ResMed, the first non-contact sleep sensor that helps you sleep better from your very first night. The S Plus is a small device that sits on your nightstand while you sleep. The device cuts through the complexities of wearing the technology by rather utilizing breath and movement sensors to analyze your sleep. Today, we will uncover the S Plus's fascinating history. See why the S Plus is the product of your dreams, check out the S Plus's nightmarish competition, and finally, we will see why ResMed's forward-thinking philanthropy is nothing to snooze on. Let's start by turning the clock back to S Plus's humble beginnings. S Plus creator and ResMed founder Peter Harrell was an MIT student when he first recognized a lack of sleep as a growing problem amongst most Americans. According to the American Sleep Association, adults need at least seven hours of sleep to properly function the next day. Yet 65% of Americans admitted that they do not reach this number, meaning the average hours of sleep per night amongst U.S. adults is only five hours. And as most of us can testify, just because you fall asleep doesn't necessarily mean you stay asleep. Those five hours don't account for the 9.3 times humans are unconsciously disrupted while sleeping, meaning in reality we're only getting about 70% of those five hours. For struggling with sleep problems of his own, Pharrell imagined what it would be like if we as humans could all fully utilize every hour of shut-eye were able to fit into our chaotic days. Now he realized he couldn't force people to go to bed earlier. However, he could help people improve the hours of sleep that they're getting by helping them eliminate the disruptions. And the S Plus was ultimately created to do just that. When we deprive our bodies of sleep, we place ourselves at risk for a variety of different health issues, including stroke, diabetes, weight gain, aging, depression, and issues with our mental processing in the areas of problem solving and memory. The S Plus is known for allotting its users an average of an extra 30 minutes of sleep per night. The S Plus is a small device that sits on your nightstand. It utilizes complex radio frequencies to pick up on your movement and breathing. The three main factors that affect our sleep are light, temperature, and noise. The S Plus combats these disruptions using its two main features. The first feature is sleep analysis. The S Plus utilizes complex radio frequencies to pick up on your movement and breathing while asleep. The device also employs monitors to see how things like light, temperature, and noise affect your sleep. In the morning, the S Plus sends the data it has collected to your Apple or Android device. Let me give you an example. My father has been complaining for months that he is exhausted. With an early morning wake-up call each and every day, a good night's sleep is of the utmost importance to him. But something was getting in the way of him achieving this. Enter the S+. 
after my dad's first night using the S Plus, he checked his phone the next morning. Lo and behold, he realized he was sharing a bed with a sleeping bear, my mom. Now, my mom, Denise, is an absolute gem, but she snores like a banshee. Thanks to the S Plus's health analysis and microphones, my parents were able to identify the issue and adjust their sleeping environment. For them, it meant firmer pillows and headphones for my dad. Months later, everyone is much more well-rested and happier. Now let's focus on a more simple issue, but perhaps the most important one to remedy. The S Plus can prevent you from waking up during your REM sleep, your deepest sleep stage where you experience dreams. Waking up during this stage can leave you feeling extremely groggy and less productive throughout your day. The S Plus combats this using its second feature, the Smart Alarm. The Smart Alarm helps you choose a 30-minute time period in which you would like to be woken, and then wakes you up during the lightest stage of that 30-minute time period. Now, let's take a look at the free app's basic features. The first thing you'll notice when checking your phone the next morning is a graph, showing you what times you were in each stage of sleep. Below it is your Composite Super Sleep Scorer, a composite score helping you keep track of your progress based on how long you spent in each stage. Next, my personal favorite feature, a numerical breakdown of just how many hours of sleep I'm really getting. This night, I thought I was getting seven hours of sleep by going to bed at 12 and waking up at seven, when in reality, I was only getting five due to my seven disruptions. As the S Plus picks up on what's affecting your sleep the most, the more you're able to adjust your sleeping environment, resulting in an improved super sleep score and therefore a better you. The range of issues the S Plus is able to fix start with blocking out noise to dealing with complex heartburn while you sleep. Now, no one likes the sound of their morning alarm, but here's another rude wake-up call for all of you Sleep Cycle and Fitbit fans out there. I think it's just about time we uncover the truth about S Plus's two top competitors. Neither the Fitbit Alta nor the Sleep Cycle app can live up to the complex radio frequencies used by the S Plus to monitor your sleep. The sensors on both of these competitors are nearly estimates. When it comes to features, the S Plus cannot be beat. While both of its competitors only allow for sleep analysis and smart alarm capabilities, the S Plus rolls over its competition by also offering health analysis, a super sleep scorer, and voice control tools. And unfortunately, with these two competitors, you'll find yourself tossing and turning. Both companies require you to wear the product or sleep with the product next to your pillow while the S Plus is completely non-contact, guaranteeing you the utmost comfort while you sleep. And surprisingly, all of this comfort and technology can be yours for the one-time investment of just $30, far less than the Fitbit Ulta coming in at a nightmarish $100, and the Sleep Cycle's repeated charges of $30 yearly. While ResMed promises its customers sweeter dreams, the company still promotes having a good handle on reality. In addition to the company's attempt to call attention to America's problems with sleep deprivation, they also promise to contribute a percentage of its annual budget to promoting primary and art schools. Just another way they help us have a brighter tomorrow. Sleep is a vital component to both our physical and mental health. The importance of getting the right amount of it should not be underestimated. It's what allows us to function and thrive in all of our daily pursuits. Now, after a long day of school, work, practice, or even forensics, I can jump into my comforter's warm embrace, knowing that I will be well rested, mentally aware, and at my physical best for the next day. Why don't we all do ourselves a favor and take the first step of investing into our sleep with the S Plus. Sweet dreams.